This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. (laughs) 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. (laughs) 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. I declare the meeting open to the public. Uh, may I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? May I also advise those in the public gallery that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted. Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. So apologies now. No apologies have been received in the committee office, but Paula Bradshaw has advised that she will be arriving a little bit late this morning. Are members aware of any apologies? Thank you. Chairperson's business then, um, just to report that myself and Pam as Deputy Chair met with Robin Swan last week um, in a, a kind of a just a, a getting to know you session. We wanted to sit down with him. We wanted to, I suppose, have a discussion around priorities for his department and for us as a committee and how we proposed to work with him. I think it's fair to say that, that we, we said to him, listen, we believe a collective approach to health here is very important. While the committee is here to scrutinise your work, that, that, and we will do that, we will not seek to uh, in any way hinder the progress that has been made or the, the, uh, the issues that that we all feel need to be progressed in the time ahead. Um, do you want to say anything about that, Pam? No, I'm happy with that, Chair. No. Yeah. The other meeting that I did this week, I had a meeting with Clare's ANA further to a long-standing engagement that I had with them in place anyway, so I, I met with Clare Anne McGee of Clare's ANA um, yesterday. So I now refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of January, which are pages 24 to 35 of the meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Can I just just a small point in my um, declaration of interest? It just it it, re it reads relatives as opposed to a relative. It's just small. And the other thing is, it's, and it may have been my wording, but just want to correct it that um, connected to the inquiry, my family members actually connected to the recall as opposed to the inquiry. But just small. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, can we take that into account? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, matters are rising. Can I advise members that statutory rule 2019 forward slash 42, the provision of health services to persons not ordinarily resident, amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, has been deferred until next week's meeting. That's to allow time for a reply from the department to our further information request in line with the agreed time scales that are in place with the department. Okay, thank you. <coughs> So we're now moving into the departmental briefing stage of our meeting this morning. Can I advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on the departmental priorities arising from the new decade, new approach document. May I also refer members to the department's first day brief at pages 38 to 81 of the pack. So I'd now like to welcome Mr. Richard Pangeli, Permanent Secretary of the Department, Ms. Deborah McNeely, Deputy Secretary of Resources and Performance Management Group, Dr. Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer, and Mr. Jackie Johnson, Deputy Secretary, Healthcare Policy Group. You're all very welcome here this morning. Um, thank you for coming along. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to now invite the officials to go ahead and, and give us your briefing, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just to check with you, I would receive word that. Be, I mean, I think normally I'd like to try and keep my opening remarks to a minimum to allow members to question, but we received a sense that given it was the first session under the committee of a particular interest in the NDNA agreement, that I'd make some pretty comprehensive opening remarks just to take through that. Just as, as you're, you're happy to proceed on that basis? Yeah, yeah. OK. OK, thank you. We'll do introductions. Firstly, I'm Richard Pingelli, Permanent Secretary of the Department. Michael McBride, very nice to meet you. Um, Deborah McNeely, Deputy Secretary for Resources and Corporate Management Group. Uh, Jackie Johnson, Deputy Secretary Healthcare Policy Group. Um, I suppose the first thing she says is great to be back, Chair, uh, with the committee. We, we look forward to establishing a very constructive relationship. And I know over the past three years you've shown a particular interest in the issues, and uh, we look forward to continuing that relationship with you and developing a relationship with other members. Um, three years ago, when the, uh, the institutions were suspended, we were in the immediate aftermath of the Ben Goa report and then the ministers delivering together strategy. 
just to say, much has happened in transformation. I think there's, uh, there is a, a narrative sometimes that uh, the transformation agenda has been gathering dust on a shelf. A lot has happened. I'll touch on some of that as, as we move through. Um, with, with your indulgence, Chair, if I could take 30 seconds just to say from a personal perspective, it, it's been a pretty tough three years. Um, we, all, all of us defer to no one in our admiration for colleagues at the front end of health and social care, doing a tremendously difficult job in challenging circumstances. Personally, I just want to acknowledge, it's, it's not often I get it in a public forum, the support of my colleagues in the department. I think the civil service has done a fantastic job. My senior colleagues here today, there's other senior colleagues. I just want um, Sharon Gallagher, Charlotte McArdle, Sean Holland, Dan West and David Gordon, part of the senior team. The support they've provided to me personally and all civil servants in the department, I'm, I'm truly in their debt for that personal support. Um, the fact that we're in the difficult position in health and social care won't be a surprise to anyone. The, if we go back to the Ben Goa report, the, that clearly foreshadowed the problems that we would encounter and the problems we're now experiencing. Just a quote from the Ben Goa report, the stark options facing the health and social care system are either to resist change and see services deteriorate to the point of collapse over time, or to embrace transformation and work to create a modern sustainable service that is properly equipped to help people stay as healthy as possible and to provide them with the right type of care when they need it. And then the Minister's Delivering Together document continued, if we persist with our current models of care, even the best efforts of staff and more investment year on year, waiting lists will continue to grow, our experience will continue to be diluted, and the best possible outcomes for patients will not be realised. That is both unacceptable and unsustainable. So a lot of important work has happened in transformation in the past three years. But I think the truth is the biggest and most challenging decisions in transformation lie ahead for an incoming minister with the support of the executive. Um, not, not to kill you with quotes, Chair, but uh, if we go back again to the launch, the then First Minister, Arlene Foster, said at the time of the launch, we either try to manage the change or we manage the chaos that would come if we don't tackle the huge issues that are there. And that was supported by the then Deputy First Minister, Martin McGuinness. Change has to happen, and the only question is whether it will happen in a controlled, planned fashion or unfold out of control. There is only one responsible choice to make. So that, that's about setting the context. As I said at the start, Chair, uh, the sense we got today that the, the committee would particularly welcome an update on the, prior, the health priority set out in the New Decade New Approach document. Um, in terms of prioritisation, I think that context I painted in terms of the need for transformation uh, clearly suggests that at a strategic level, transformation is the absolute priority. I know uh, the Minister has met the Chair and Vice Chair. Uh, he's very keen to come along to the committee uh, and talk through his own personal priorities. And I think that's, that's a future session that uh, you'll, you'll work with him. Um, in terms of uh, specific commitments, I was just going to, to take each of them, work through and give the committee an overview of where we are and some of the challenges in it. Uh, the first issue, thankfully, now is an easy one. Immediately settled the ongoing pay dispute. Um, the committee is aware of the, the wide-ranging industrial action at the latter part of 2019, the early part of this year. You'll, you'll also recall that I was on record many times as saying that my own ability to solve that in the absence of ministers was severely constrained by an absence of both authority and funding. But the, the return of the Assembly and Executive this month um, I think that the first order of business for the executive was to provide financial support to the minister who took the decision to restore pay parity. There's been some intense dialogue over the last couple of days. The unions are now going out to ballot their members. Uh, as, as we speak, uh, bar one union, all industrial action has been paused pending the, the result of that ballot. So that issue is resolved. I just want to put a clear marker down. The Minister has indicated his clear intent and ambition to work closely with trade union colleagues in terms of moving forward through both transformation and other issues, and it's a relationship that we'll look to build on. second issue in the document was to introduce a new action plan on waiting times. need to record at the start, and we've said this many times, it's no less true for that, it's simply unacceptable that any patient has to wait longer than they should for assessment or treatment. Immediate and sustained action is needed to bring waiting lists under control. Just to be clear from our perspective, this isn't necessarily part of transformation, but it's an essential accompaniment to it. 
Transformation will not clear the backlog of people waiting for treatment. Transformation will ensure that in the future backlogs will not accumulate if we better align demand and capacity. In terms of context, I think if, if we go back to about 2005, uh, at that stage we had uh, the first signs of the material mismatch between demand and capacity. At that stage, the financial position allowed the executive to make available to us significant in-year monitoring allocations, which allowed us to undertake waiting list initiatives to keep a lid on the position. But as the financial challenges bit, particularly from about 2015 onwards, that additional funding wasn't made available and the waiting lists have started to grow, and you can track the graph uh, clearly since then. So to eradicate the waiting lists, we need very significant funding on a sustained basis. Um, in terms of capacity, if all the money in the world was made available to us today, we couldn't clear those waiting lists overnight. There is a real capacity issue uh, across the sector. But the Minister has clearly indicated uh, an early intent to tackle that, that enduring problem of waiting lists. Um, that general desire is backed up by a specific commitment in the document that no one waiting over a year at the 30th of September 2019 will still be in a waiting list by March 2021. We estimate that would cost about £50 million to deliver that commitment. The logistical issue for us is that in getting that money, we would need an early indication of the money. I think to successfully address it, we will need to attract new players into the market in Northern Ireland. It will be a combination of a bit of additional in-house activity, but the reality is we're pretty much at the upper range of what we can do in additional in-house activity. We'll need to utilise the independent sector. There's a concern about the capacity at the moment, so I think we'll need early indication of funds to address that. Moving on, the uh, next issue is delivering reforms in health and social care set out in the Bengoa, delivering together in part of the people reports. <coughs> I've already touched on transformation um, and where we are. Our view is that to take forward the transformation strategy, we would need about £150 million a year on a sustained basis. Um, we've had £100 million a year for each of the last two years through the confidence and supply mechanism, but significant funding will be needed. In terms of progress made through that confidence and supply, some really good, just a few brief examples. Uh, the introduction of multidisciplinary teams in primary care to expand the range of services. That's being received um, very positively, both by those working in primary community care, but also by the, the service users there. We've established prototype elective care centres to transform the delivery of non-complex day case surgery. <coughs> Signs of safety, a new model for social work has been introduced, which empowers families to build on their own strengths and support family wellbeing. And new outreaches to vulnerable groups, including uh, an HIV prevention clinic and a new homelessness hub. So all good illustrations of where transformation is taking us. In terms of the Power to People report, um, again by way of context, I think one of the major successes of health and social care over the last number of years has been to help people survive illness and diseases that previously would have been fatal. This has led to a growth of the number of older people in our society, and the next 50 years our over 65 population is likely to double. That represents a huge challenge to us, but it's a, a very positive sign of success that we're, we're working well in this space. That demographic change is going to require us to rethink how we provide care and support for older people as well as people with learning disabilities, physical or sensory disabilities, or mental health. The expert panel report, Part of People, was published in December 2017, contains 16 recommendations. We have established a project board. We are currently working through those proposals and developing a full costing for implementation. But at a high level, they will include increased investment in providing sustainable pay levels for social care, which is a key challenge for us testing and promoting new models of care and additional training to support new ways of working. In terms of an indication of cost, so I'm still recovering from a bit of a Christmas gold chair, sir. Um, an additional £2.50 on the headline rate of pay for our dumb care colleagues would cost around £29 million. That's probably something above that, to be honest, is needed to make the sector sustainable. I think 
it's, it's worth any time of touching this to pay tribute uh, to those individuals who work in the domiciliary care sector. I, I think it was probably one of the most challenging jobs in society. Um, currently very poorly remunerated. I think to make the sector sustainable, we need to look closely at that issue. Um, the document then moves into a bit more specific territory. Um, the executive will reconfigure hospital provision to deliver better patient outcomes, more stable services and sustainable staffing. Improvements will be made in stroke breast assessment, urgent and emergency care and day case elective care by the end of 2020. Um, touched on some of the issues about stability and pressures on staff. A lot of that flows from the pressure on emergency departments, and I think the committee members will all have seen the stats published uh, recently on that. Apart from the increase in numbers, there's a, a very significant increase in the complexity of conditions presenting at ED, particularly amongst the frail elder, that growing frail elderly population. The consequence of that is patients are facing unacceptable weights and staff are under intolerable pressure. So that, that's a clear priority, and the reform of urgent and emergency care is, is, is one of the issues at the top of our to-do list. Uh, a clinically-led review of urgent emergency care is ongoing, and the aim of that is to establish a new sustainable regional care model for the next 10 to 15 years. The initial report is currently being drafted, and that will include an analysis of the current challenges, and will set out some immediate and longer-term solutions to that problem. And we hope to have an interim report with the Minister by about April of this year. In terms of stroke care, um, there is huge potential to improve the quality of stroke services in Northern Ireland. Currently, services are spread too thinly, and not everyone receives the right treatment at the right time, resulting in poorer outcomes for stroke survivors and carers. So in March 2019, we launched a consultation on reshaping stroke care. We view this as a once-in-a-generation opportunity to ensure high-quality, sustainable service, which focuses on improving outcomes. And just within that, a very, very stark illustration of the opportunity for us here is that currently across Northern Ireland, our, our current configuration of model delivers about 16, 16 good outcomes per 1,000 patients. Any of the options that we consulted in that public consultation would double that number to around 32, 33. So it, present some challenges to us, but huge opportunity in terms of improvement in care. Obviously, the public is interested in this. 19,000 responses to the consultation. Over 1,600 people attended public consultation events. It's an issue that people feel very, very strongly about, and rightly so. So we're taking some time to consider those views. Uh, we're in the final stages now of uh, preparing a consultation analysis to inform the way forward. and uh, that will be with the Minister very, very quickly. And as for stroke, there's also significant potential to improve breast assessment services. And also, like stroke, there's been very significant public interest, uh, both at uh, community level, political level, healthcare professionals, uh, and the, the general public. The, we're currently carefully considering the views expressed in public consultation particularly that complex link between breast assessment and the broader best breast cancer treatment pathway. And again, the Minister will be considering that and bringing forward proposals in the very, very near future. Day case elective care centres are a means to increase productivity and sustain high quality. They will have a significant impact on the number of patients we're able to treat. Concentrating services on a smaller number of locations does mean that some patients may have to travel a bit further for day surgery. But the clear trade-off will be a significant reduction in the time spent waiting. We've, in December 2018, we established two prototypes for the treatment of cataracts and varicose veins. Emerging experience is hugely positive, both for service users and for colleagues in the system. The next phase of work on uh, this piece is going to uh, there's task and finish groups being set up to consider a range of specialties and, and what specific procedures would lend themselves to this. Just in terms of the specialties we're looking at, general surgery, endoscopy, trauma and orthopaedics, urology, ENT, gynaecology and children's services, so covering a huge area in that. Um, and again, we, we, there wasn't a public consultation on the prototype, because there, there were prototypes where we're, where we're testing how we expand this. There will be public consultation when we look to, to roll out this model of care. Um, the next commitment, the executive will deliver an extra 900 nursing and midwifery undergraduate places over the next three years. 
Um, by way of background, our, our current commissioning level is at an all-time high, with 1,025 places commissioned in 2019. The first 300 additional will commence training from September 2020, and therefore will enter the, work, uh, the workforce in 2023, and, and by 2025, the full 900 will have completed their training. We estimate that will have uh, a recurring cost of 2.4 million in 2021, rising to 12.4 million in 23-24. Next issue is the consideration of changing how waiting times are measured to reflect the entire patient journey from referral to treatment with appropriate targets. Uh, this hasn't been the previous policy priority for the department, but given the commitment, we're now undertaking some detailed work on it, and particularly the scope viability. And in particular, we'll be paying close attention to what's happening in other <coughs> jurisdictions and some of the lessons there. Just to emphasise that, that this target is very much about measuring what we do, and in itself, the target doesn't go to changing what we do. That uh, washes through in other areas. Um, the next area is the executive will publish a mental health action plan within two months, a uh, mental health strategy by December 2020, a successor strategy and action plan to the strategic direction for alcohol and drugs phase two within three months, and a new strategy and implementation plan on cancer by December 2020. Starting firstly with mental health, uh, since uh, summer 2018, the department has been working on a mental health action plan uh, that was co-produced uh, across a range of groups, covers both immediate service developments and longer term work, but it is a stopgap until the new mental health strategy is in place at the end of the year. Like the action plan, the strategy will be co-produced with service users, professionals and other stakeholders. And uh, after that piece of co-production, the draft strategy will be subject to public consultation. Suicide prevention is a very topical issue for us at the moment and it remains a key priority for the department. Um, evidenced by the, re by the September 2019 publication of the Protect Life 2 strategy, a new steering group has been set up and is currently being chair chaired by the Chief Medical Officer. The key point in this is we're, we're trying to ensure the focus on suicide prevention is seen as a societal issue and seeks to ensure collaborative cross-departmental engagement to address the risk factors for suicide and self-harm as well as engagement across wider society. For our part, there's a lot more we could be doing in health and social care, but I think the real heavy lifting to address this deep-rooted problem lies probably out with the health service, but that's work that we'll need to do in partnership with colleagues across the public sector and the community sector. Um, turning into alcohol and drugs, each and every drug-related death is preventable, and it's a key priority for the department to address that. Again, that will involve cross-sectoral working with the Department of Justice and the Police Service. In 2019, we published a review of the existing alcohol and drugs misuse strategy, the new strategic direction for alcohol and drugs. And over the course of that, there were some encouraging signs in relation to reductions in uh, substance misuse at a population level. In particular, there's been significant reductions in the level of binge drinking and the percentage of young people who drink and get drunk. But as we can see in the recent uh, drug-related death figures, this is being offset by increases in a range of indicators related to harm. There's also ongoing concerns about polydrug misuse, the misuse of prescription drugs and new psychoactive substances. The, just, the reality is there seems to be a significant cohort of people engaging in increasingly risky behaviour, causing an acute interest in related harms. So we have begun the development of a new substance misuse strategy this will be developed and signed again with input from all key stakeholders, including service users, to improve services and take innovative and effective action to reduce alcohol and drug-related harm. Ministers indicated he's particularly keen to work with other ministers to address the underlying causes of substance misuse, such as poverty, unemployment, <coughs> homelessness, loneliness, as well as providing within our sector the treatment services and assistance to those with concurrent mental health issues. Again, that holistic, holistic cross-sectoral working is essential to making progress in this area. Turning then to the cancer strategy, um, our clear vision is for Northern Ireland to become one of the highest performing cancer healthcare systems internationally, with a reputation for delivering timely and high quality care, with patient survival rates which compare favourably with similar populations, and demonstrate a collective approach to leadership and a system that's committed to providing com compassionate care. Good progress has been made on the development of the strategy, and that will guide the delivery of services over the next decade. 
we would hope that the strategy will be available in the autumn of this year for ministerial consideration. It will focus on fewer people getting preventable cancers, more people surviving for longer after diagnosis, and improving the experience of care for patients. Uh, the next issue is to build capacity in general practice through the ongoing rollout of multidisciplinary teams to cover a further 100,000 patients by March 2021. I've already touched on the, the value of MDTs. They they're absolutely represent the cornerstone of our plans to transform <coughs> health and social care. We reckon that by the end of this financial year, 462,000 patients will have access to uh, primary care multidisciplinary teams in their local GP practice. We are committed to roll out as rapidly as possible to uh, the whole population. Again, the pace of that will be subject to funding constraints. Um, the Executive will provide increased investment to fully implement service improvements for palliative care and end-of-life care, including enhancing the contribution of hospices and to increase support for palliative perinatal care. Firstly, Chair, it's important to acknowledge the contribution and work done by hospices across Northern Ireland in terms of delivering quality care, uh, palliative and end-of-life care for adults and children. Uh, that said, the hospices clearly have significant funding uh, pressures. The Health and Social Care Board is currently reviewing funding for adult hospice, and this work will conclude shortly. <coughs> we will consider the outcome of that work and any action that is necessary in follow-up in the context of the emerging budget allocations, as, as we will hopefully shortly receive them. The transformation funding that I touched on earlier has allowed some progress to be made in a number of areas to support palliative and end-of-life services for adults, including the development of specialist palliative care workforce, an early identification project in a number of GP practices, further, ro further rollout of the Marie Curie Rapid Response Service, GP and palliative care education and training. And again, this is uh, one of the particular areas the Minister has indicated his, his personal support for rapid progress to be made. Um, the Executive will provide three funded cycles of IVF treatment. Just in terms of context, the Regional Fertility Centre is Northern Ireland's only public provider of IVF. At the moment, it, it just does not have the capacity to deliver three cycles to all eligible women. Uh, that is not so much a money issue, it is more about infrastructure and people, people with the right skills set and the infrastructure to do it. So the first step for us will be to secure additional funding and then to look to a rollout of that model. But I think it is important to be clear that even if the money is made available instantly, I think th th there is a longer term dimension to this. The specialist skill set that is needed cannot be produced overnight in this, but, but we will give it our close attention. The Executive will expand university provision at McGee in line with commitments made by the previous Executive, including through the establishment of a graduate entry medical school. The Keith Gardner work, the Medical Student Place Review, published in January 19, clearly indicated the need for an expansion of medical student places in Northern Ireland. So we are currently working through a business case in terms of how that can be rolled out. And again, I think it will be part of the forthcoming budget discussions in terms of the developing and considering the pace of that. Um, finally, then, Chair, the Executive will bring about parity and financial support to victims of contaminated blood in Northern Ireland with those in England. Just by way of background, this, this issue goes back to the 70s and 80s when the use of contaminated blood was clearly a tragedy. Um, the Minister is acutely aware of the terrible suffering and financial hardship to people that people have endured as a result of uh, receiving the devastating diagnosis following receipt of contaminated blood. The Minister is committed to addressing the disparity in regular payments which arose between Northern Ireland and England. Earlier this week, he announced a measure to move to close that gap, and there is further detailed work ongoing in the Department in, in terms of what longer-term financial support might be in place. And, I think the, the Minister uh, is putting a lot of pressure on, on us to be in a position to conclude on that shortly. Chair, that was, apologies for the length of that, was, but I think it was important just to go through all those issues. In, in terms of a couple of closing remarks, again, it bears repetition we face huge challenges going forward. And also to acknowledge that every day that we don't address those challenges, those challenges become tougher. But being positive about this, we have a new and ambitious health minister. We have a reinvigorated and collaborative executive. 
broader political agreement um, that I've just worked through that both underpins a shared commitment to address these challenges and sets out some specific areas for immediate action. So I think there is genuine cause for optimism in terms of our ability to rise to and meet these challenges. But that said, the road ahead will be difficult. Transformation will require all of us who work in this system to work differently, to think differently, to work with colleagues in other sectors. But it will also require users of the service to access care differently, sometimes in different locations. But it will mean better care, and I don't think we should ever lose sight of that as the prize. Better care, better outcomes, better quality of life. Um, just as a final comment, Chair, I think that the Minister certainly wouldn't forgive me if it didn't, despite having outlined those challenges, we need to continually acknowledge that every day amazing people are doing miraculous things in our health and social care system. There are a huge number of good things that happen every day, and, and we all know from either personal experience or the experience of loved ones that uh, the challenges remain. People are, are working beyond themselves to provide high quality care. It's always important just to acknowledge that and place on record our thanks for it. Say, so, huge thanks to colleagues across the system. Those of us at this end certainly feel very privileged to be part of a system that does things. But certainly, I just want to assure you of our ambition to drive that forward and make improvements. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I suppose on, on behalf of the committee, uh, we would, I'm sure we would all acknowledge the efforts of the, of the staff on the ground in, in hugely complex and difficult situations, and that there's a, a, a onus on all of us to work to address some of the many issues that are arising. In light of your opening remarks there in relation to the new, D, new the NDMA document and, and the an acknowledgement that that was a document produced by the two governments, mm -hmm. and there are a number of commitments within it, and it's crucial that those commitments are met and are financed and resourced in a mm -hmm. way that they're practical. But just focusing, you, you finished up there with a, with a, a run-through on the contaminated blood mm -hmm. and the people affected by that. So can you outline to the committee how you plan, the department plans to ensure that the £1 million that was allocated by the Finance Minister, Conor Morphy, will be uh, used in full to the benefit of those victims in the very short period of time that, that it applies yeah, to? Yes, Chair. The, there, there's a piece of detailed work uh, that's ongoing. The, the issue for us is the, we talk about those infected and those affected. We want to better understand the consequences of that in terms of what are the specific challenges that it means for individuals, and we want to address those. I think in some cases, Chair, that will mean financial support. In some cases, it may mean additional service provision and wraparound services for them. So there's a piece of work establishing that. What happened earlier this week was a consequence of the Minister recognised that notwithstanding the need for that detailed work to understand exactly how best to support them, there was an urgent need to give some additional financial support. So that went out this week. The piece of work I'm talking about will conclude before the end of this financial year to allow the Minister to then conclude how best to deploy the remaining amount of that million pounds that was allocated, but that will be done before the end of this financial year. And what is, the, what is the remaining amount? What's, what's the, the amount that's remaining? I, I think the package this week cost about £600,000, so there's about £400,000 left to be. But the issue is to determine how best to deploy that to properly support the individuals affected by this. But I take it if we're talking about services that these, these affected people are entitled to the core services, free at the point of need as every other. So oh, we're not... No, but what, what we're talking about... It's a, sorry, I'm... Not to confuse Chair, that the 400,000 residual that's available, we're not talking about using any of that to pay for services. We're to, the, the consideration will be how best to allocate that by way of financial support to the individuals. Separately, we want to think are there any other ways that we can reshape or bend services to better meet the needs? So it will be a supplementary piece of work. But the residual, and my concern would be the residual. We only have to the end of March. Yes. So, how long is it going to remain residual? We need that. We need that money that, that, to be to be yes, got that, that, into effect for those. That, that for will those be people. done before the end of March, Chair. Yeah. And are the are the people who are affected? Are they happy with the approach that you have taken to date? Um, I think the the minister plans to meet them shortly. I don't know if there's yes. a date available I'm for. I'm not that. sure if that date's been confirmed, Chair. Um, but the minister is absolutely keen to engage with those uh, individuals and those families that have been directly affected so that that actually frames and informs how best 
to ensure that we're meeting uh, meeting those those needs. So that, that is something that the minister has requested uh, as soon as is possible. And there is an effective plan uh, uh, operating in England. Are you taking your lead from in terms of that? That that what's already in place can be adopted here. Um, we're, we're, we're taking some cognizance of it. I think there was, uh, I, in the absence of ministers, I participated in a Four Nations ministerial call in about July of this year. It was clear in that call that uh, Scotland had done a more substantive piece of work in terms of looking at the issues that are caused uh, by the infected blood issue. So we're, we're paying close attention to that. Um, the increase in payments in England was decided at very short notice with heavy ministerial engagement. The issue that we're saying in our environment is for the minister, he wants to be very clear that he understands what is the specific mm. problem and challenges that the individuals face and how best can we address that. So I don't want to use the phrase chair, it's not about throwing money out the door, it's about putting money in the hands of individuals that best supports the difficulties that have been caused by the system letting them down in the past. Yeah. And in conjunction with those with those people who have been affected, and in, in, yes, in, yeah. in, on, on the basis of parity that, that the people here are not uh, at disadvantage in any way versus people across yes, any of the other any of the other regions. Okay, the final one for me before I open up to members then is in relation to the Eddie Lynch, the, the Copney report mm -hmm. and uh, his his disappointment at the pace of change mm -hmm. um, and you know, that, that things have been taken an extended period of time. What are the department doing currently to drive that change forward at pace? Well, the, one of the particular issues in terms of the pace, a significant number of the recommendations from the Commissioner, uh, you know, there's recommendations that required legislative change. So um, a lot of them couldn't be, they couldn't be formally progressed until we had a minister in place. That's not to say that work didn't start immediately within the department. So we're working on that. Um, we have received, you'll be aware that we um, appointed an independent review. We have received for fact checking the first report from the independent review and the safeguarding dimension that's currently with, it, with us for fact checking. So that will go back and we, we anticipate formally receiving that very, very shortly, which will allow us to start moving in that. There'll be other components of <laughs> the report of the independent group. There's clearly they need to engage with PSNI because of the ongoing PSNI work in this place. They just need to make sure that um, when they're finalising the report, that PSNI feel it, it, it's not detrimental to any ongoing work on their part. But significant programme of work, again, something the Minister has come in in the first couple of weeks, shown a very, very close personal interest in, and we'll be moving forward at pace with this. And I think, again, that's important that the improvements in terms of added social care on safeguarding of people who may be at risk of, at yes. risk of harm is a, is a priority. I know it's a priority for the Minister, it's certainly a priority for this committee. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll open up now to members for questions and I would ask members to restrict just in, in the interest of giving everyone uh, a good opportunity to two questions initially. If we have time for some further questions, we'll come back on that. And we could ask you all to, to keep questions brief, please, as far as possible. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I have a number of indications from earlier in the presentation, starting with Alex and then Jerry and, and Gemma and Sinead. Sure. Thank you for your presentation. Um, there's so many questions I could ask, but obviously I can't. Um, the first one, waiting times. Yeah, obviously it's vital that we, we get on top of that. And um, it's, you know, it's good that we're, we're looking at that. However, my problem with tackling waiting lists is we can put all the money we want into it and we can hire in the, the independent sector to, to help with that. But there's other issues with it that I don't think you are looking at, maybe. You know, there's like 200,000 odd outpatient appointments that are missed by patients, which is causing us a problem. What are we doing to try and tackle that aspect of it? Because it can't just be us throwing money at it all the time. There has to be a change in mindset as well because that's that's causing part of the problem as well and then um we've got a couple of thousand nurses vacancies so obviously you don't have as many nurses as you need to be doing the outpatient appointments as well so what are you doing to address that so that's my first question um my second question is on nurses again we're, we're getting 900 nurses new which is great after declaring interest my sister's a nurse <laughs> Um, 
But there's 2,000 vacancies. Are these 900 vacancies that we're going to do for training, is that to make up these 2,000 vacancies, or is this 900 on top of the 2,000? Um, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Colleagues may want to, to chip in. Um, yeah, sure. in, ter in terms of missed appointments... Yeah. Um, it's shocking, the number. It, it, it's, it is. Um, it, it would be too easy to, you know, one easy solution would be to charge people for missed appointments. I, I suspect that may, and I, I make that analogy because uh, the vast majority of dentist practices, for example, now uh, charge for missed appointments. That doesn't raise any money, but it massively curtails the number of missed appointments. So th there is a behavioural bit. Now, to be clear, I'm not advocating that we um, charge for that. That's just at one extreme. I think it's about, for us, it's about patient education. It's about working with people. The big game changer for us, uh, in many ways, will be the rollout of, I'm sure you've heard of the Encompass problem, uh, Encompass system, which is a new integrated uh, electronic <coughs> care record. That will, that will make it much easier. I mean, at the moment, we have a partial booking system. So trust will write an individual with an outpatient appointment. They, so rather than just be giving a date, which may or may not work, you're told that your, your slot has come up. You contact the trust, you make an appointment at a, at a time and a date that suits, so that, that's made some impact on it. Um, and Compass will make it much easier for individuals to engage with health and social care through their own phones and mobile devices. Um, it, it will facilitate uh, a number of reminders going out. Um, I think it's important also to acknowledge that the number of missed appointments it is very significant. They're not all missed opportunities for treatment. Because there has been a historic pattern of missed appointments, in many ways we overbook. So on any given day, um, if, if we knew that tomorrow there wasn't going to be any missed appointments, we would book fewer slots. So it's just trying to understand that one-for-one -one relationship. Um, I think we also need to acknowledge, too, there are num far too many appointment slots cancelled by hospitals and by consultants. So. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an issue with patients, there's an issue with us in the system and how we work, but it is an issue for close attention. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good point, um, um, Alex, and um, it's something which you know we've discussed previously um, over quite a number of years. And we never get I think there, you remember. So there's, um, I think there's a body of work that we need to look at, at the overall role of uh, outpatients and reviews, and again, as Richard said, alternative models of care, as he said in his opening comments, and the frequency by which individuals are referred into outpatients for opinions, alternative mechanisms <laughs> by which primary care can obtain, opinions which doesn't require, and there are, a member, there are a number of mechanisms already in place whereby GPs can get advice from consultants which doesn't require a referral for an outpatient appointment. Again, alternatives to maintaining people who have long-term conditions rather than reviewing them uh, at outpatient clinics, and, and Richard has given one example where the new electronic care record will allow people to have access to their own health care record to manage their own care. So there are technological solutions uh, to this as well, and Encompass uh, certainly opens up uh, that, that potential. Uh, there are other it, it mechanisms uh, as well that we are doing short term. I think we also need to recognise that the number of cancellations is not unrelated to the length of time people are waiting. Um, and the work that we're doing around the tran wider transformation piece in terms of how we deliver health and social care uh, will uh, shorten uh, those waiting times and, uh, as I say, I think will significantly improve the, uh, and reduce the rates of cancellations within the wider system. Um, Briefly, your, your other point, I think the nursing vacancies in the 900, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. The, the nursing vacancies are the number of vacancies that we're actively recruiting to at the moment, so that, that's the demand side of the equation, how many we need. The 900 additional places will be addressing some issues on the supply side, or putting more nurses into circulation. So I, I, wouldn't, I, I think the, by the end of this, there'll be 900 more nurses available to apply for those vacancies, so it isn't sitting on top yeah. of the number of existing vacancies. Um, we also, as you're aware, there's ongoing international recruitment, so we're focusing on producing our own, but we're also looking internationally to try and supplement the workforce. Thank you. Can I clarify some? Oh, yeah. Can you go back to these nurses? There's 2,000-odd vacancies, mm -hmm. and there's 900 new nurses coming in. 
So 900 of these nurses will fill some of these vacancies that are already there. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, then that's not really 900 new nurses, is it? On top of the 2,000 vacancies but that are the already 2, there. 2,000 vacancies are places where there mm. are no nurses. So putting yeah. training and just to be clear, the, the 900 is an increase. So we're producing 1,025 per annum at the moment. That, that's the number that we're putting into training. This is 300 a year over three years on top of that. Right. So if those numbers maintain, that's over the course of three years, we will produce in excess of 3,000, well, about 4,000 additional nurses if we're okay. currently sitting at just over 2,000 vacancies. Right, OK. I'm going to sound stupid, sorry. <laughs> it's probably me, sorry. No, it's probably me. Um, there's 2,000 jobs that are not filled by nurses at the moment because there's vacancies. Mm -hmm. OK. So that's 2,000 jobs. OK. We're recruiting 900 nurses. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to fill the 2,000. And that they're meant to be new nurses on top of what we're already doing. Yeah. So we're really still another 2,000 odd nurses short, even with these 900. No, but if the, the and nurse... they're only going to fill those 2,000 places anyway. But Could you deal with that briefly, Richard? I want to keep moving on yeah, to sure. other members, the, please. The, the, the 2,000, that's not to say there's a permanent <coughs> hole in excess of 2,000. That's yeah. the number of vacancies. So if, if you look at the 2,000 odd vacancies today and you look at it six months ago, they're different jobs because we are continually recruiting. Well, I think it, the, the more important figure is the size of the workforce. I think there's about 22,000 yeah. nurses uh, in the system. Mm -hmm. So we're producing currently 1,000 a year. We're going to supplement that by 300. So 1,300 new nurses every year will be available to join the workforce. Okay. okay. We, also, yeah, we also have to deal with turnover. So you will have within the existing cohort people who retire, people who leave. So it's, it's not just a, a clean figure, as it were. Okay. That has to be taken into yeah, there's and, and Thank you, Alex. I think Alex, I'll declare an interest in that my wife is a nurse and actually has worked on the Marie Curie rapid response, so as, as mentioned previously. And um, also, notably, the, the reference to compass and, techno and technological advances medical care actually highlights the imperative of dealing with a uh, rural broadband in many areas west of the pond, which, which underlines the cross cutting nature of a lot of the difficulties and challenges ahead. And, and so, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Richard, for that. Uh, two questions for now, Chair, and if there's a further round, one quick question. Um, in November 2019, 28th of November uh, 2019, Richard, you had a, a statement on the department's website, and just to quote from it briefly, um, in relation to pay party, you said, I wanted to offer a higher pay raise, but it wasn't possible. The simple matter of fact, the department doesn't have, a, have the money to fund a higher increase in pay. Given the minister's statement, obviously, uh, around pay parity, um, that no new money will be in, uh, in place, and the fact that the money for pay parity is coming from current uh, budgets and future uh, health budgets, would you and I accept that that was incorrect? And at the time, I would ask, where was that information that uh, you uh, made your statement upon where was that uh, gathered from? Uh, second question, Chair and Richard, um, in regards to the neurology uh, recall, um, I've been working quite closely with some of the families. I think other members have been too. Uh, it's my understanding that the department and the uh, yourself, Richard, and uh, others uh, in the higher echelons of the, of the Department of Health aren't meeting the patients. Um, it's also my understanding that uh, there's no harm assessment being done, despite um, patients being told that that would be uh, in place. Um, and they feel sure that um, there's no robust uh, mental health support in place. They feel that there's a um, a block from the department and uh, from the trusts. They feel that communication is not really uh, existing. Um, and, and essentially, obviously, they want uh, answers to their questions, to their trauma that they went through. But also, they, they said to me, and I met them, uh, some of them recently, uh, yesterday, they want to prevent something like this happening to anybody again, because it's, it, it was certainly horrendous what people uh, went through. Um, so just to ask a question on that, um, will you, Richard, as Permanent Secretary, uh, meet those, uh, a section of those patients to try and hear those concerns? And I, I understand there's an RQIA inquiry ongoing, but that's independent uh, as far as I understand. And obviously with the statement from uh, Mr McBray that uh, the Health Minister is meeting people in the blood inquiry, which I think is important, I think it's, uh, it's imperative that uh, the Department and yourself, Richard, will meet those uh, patients to hear some of the concerns. 
Okay, thanks. Um, on the, the the second issue, Jackie, the urology will come to that in a minute. I, the, the first issue, the November 2009, absolutely stand over my statement. In November, that was a statement of factual accuracy. Um, in November 2019 and today, I have a budget for the 2019-20 year. That's the only budget that's available. In so that's all the money. Uh, if I go back to November 2009, that's all the money I had to play with. In terms of the money available to me then, I had no money to add to the envelope that was available for pay. What happened when a minister was appointed? He went to the executive and asked the executive to allocate further money to this year, to the health budget for this year. The, exec the, the statement about it came from future years is how the executive sourced that funding. That's an issue out with the Department of Health. But so it, was no, it was no new money, it was, it was current money in the department future some of it and no but future, it, it wasn't money in the department because what they were saying is they know the executive knows money will be available to the northern ireland block in future years that they will be making available to health they were effectively pre-allocating to health but it's only at the point it's allocated to health that becomes our budget it was an executive decision that gave the minister the money to make it at the time in november 19 when i made the statement all I had available to me was the money that was available to me, so the statement was absolutely accurate, and I'm very happy to stand over it. Um, in terms of urology, it, it sort of this cuts yeah. across both Jackie and Michael to an extent. Yeah, do you want me to start, Michael? Yeah, yeah. you start. Okay, sure. Um, in terms of the the, uh, the meeting with patients, what we've been trying to do is to meet with patient representative groups. So that's been primarily with the Northern Ireland Neurological Charities Alliance. So uh, CMO and Richard have met with the, 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 that group um, uh, quite frequently in order to hear the concerns of patients being channeled through those um, uh, voluntary and charitable organisations. Um, so that we, we thought that that provided the best opportunity in terms of getting a, um, a focused uh, response to the concerns of patients. However, very happy um, to take us offline with a member and to um, explore in detail the concerns that have been raised with, with, with yourself. Just on that quickly, Chair, I mean, I mean uh, my understanding is there's a group, I'm not sure if they're involved in group you referenced, of, of quite a lot of people who I believe are maybe not in touch with that organisation, and I don't know how many people was met, but it's quite substantial, so off uh, after the committee I can certainly pass on details, and I know a lot of people would be happy if, if arrangement could be put in place, if Richard could. Those, those yes, we'll, 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 we'll certainly do that. And with regard to um, uh, uh, support from the mental health services and counselling, um, our understanding is the Belfast Trust have been offering that service, and we certainly haven't heard from the Trust, again, any deficiencies in relation to the support services. So, again, if there are specific Just quickly examples, on that, sure. Yeah. My understanding is, I'm happy to be corrected, is it's the basic um, like six weeks that patients are being offered, and, and many of them, um, I'm led to believe, need more detailed um, treatment, service, support, counselling. So uh, I think it needs to be a bit of work uh, by the department to, to look at some more extensive um, mental health support, trauma counselling, or, or issues of that nature. Okay, happy to take yeah, that offline. I can, I can inform that discussion. I can update you on that. Yeah. There has been progress on that, so happy to do that offline. Yeah. I um, also note that the committee has asked for an update from the department on this issue. This is an issue, <coughs> issue that we will be focusing on yeah. quite closely over the um, over think, period ahead. I think the other key point was in relation to the um, compensation for harm uh, caused. Um, what we're proposing is um, a system whereby individuals who've been affected by the recall uh, can make a claim uh, in terms of their um, their concerns about the impact on their health and their well-being. So, in terms of those individual litigation claims, um, the issue of harm or distress would be considered within that. So, there's not a separate scheme, as it were, to assess uh, harm. I think would have to be on the basis of the individual claim coming forward. And there's been um, quite a lot of work done around the system to develop that uh, claims process um, to try and make it as uh, user-friendly as possible and as less adversarial as possible. So the, uh, the, the Director of Legal Services and the Business Service Organisation has been, has been working on that. But again, if the committee is going to have a more in-depth session on that, we'd be very happy to come back and talk about that in, in detail. So okay. hope that's reassured the member. Yeah, I can pass it on. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so I now have then Gemma, Sinead and then Arlea. So Gemma. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Richard, for the presentation. Um, my two questions. Um, the first one is around primary care. Um, and can you outline plans to alleviate rural GP pressures? 
and the other one is around the cuts to the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, is there evidence of road proofing being carried out on that? Yeah. In, in, in terms of uh, the pressures in primary uh, care services, I think a lot, of, a lot of the work that we're doing in MDTs is, is fundamentally about reducing GP workload. A lot of the pressures are caused, particularly we, we get practices closing, by the, the workload is becoming intolerable for into, particularly um, single-handed practices. Yeah. So I think the, the expansion of MDTs, it's about taking a lot of the workload. GPs are currently doing a lot of work that can be done arguably better by physiotherapists, practice-based pharmacists. So I think that will help. We've also, over the past number of years, increased the number of GP training places available. We're now up to over 100, 111, um, 111 training places. Um, our, our colleagues in the board are, are, are currently uh, looking at that. and. Uh, I think it's this year for the first time, despite the increase in places, we didn't fill every place. So there's further work in terms of making that proposition more attractive. But mm -hmm. I think th the real path to address this is to make uh, working in primary care a much more tra attractive and tolerable proposition for our medical colleagues, because it, 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 it has been uh, a difficult place for the last number of years. It, it has, and, and uh, we've worked very closely with the Royal College of General uh, Practice and with, with uh, the BMA as, as well in terms of uh, the, both their reviews and that there's been significant work taken forward by uh, the our, uh, GP colleagues in relation to the establishment of, of GP federations, uh, so that GPs working in, in clusters to actually improve the resilience uh, amongst uh, practices, and that has uh, significantly helped. Uh, there are, as also have, you ind have indicated as well, there are pressures not just in the in-hours uh, primary care service, uh, but also in GP uh, out of our service, and that is a particular uh, challenge uh, in rural areas and through, again, um, monies obtained through the Conference of Supply Agreement and through other uh, core funding, we have sought to uh, make investment to uh, look at GP out of our services, look at skill mix, for instance. Uh, to have more nurse practitioners uh, supporting uh, GPs and actually to get messages out to the public as well in terms of more effective use of uh, GP uh, services and that includes alternatives so again working with the uh, you know community uh, pharmacy again a uh, significant role uh, that they can play a uh, much valued uh, uh, part of the of the team uh, in relation to uh, alternatives in terms of that that uh, community pharmacists can provide as well. Uh, in terms of fire and rescue service, I think that the, uh, the question, if I've understood it, probably really goes more to some operational decisions that have been taken by NIFERS. Like, like all organisations across the public sector, and particularly health and, uh, within our family, uh, they face difficult financial challenges. They've had to reshape some of their services. Those are operational issues taken by the Chief Fire and Rescue Officer, who has assured us at all stages that those uh, all services remain safe and viable. The department has an independently appointed expert who advises us. He has separately provided us with assurance, but I'm happy to, to speak directly with you and we, we can yeah. engage the Chief Fire and Rescue Officer as part yeah, of that conversation, great, yeah. if that would be helpful. Yeah, that would be helpful, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I have Sinead, Orlea, Pam and then Paula. So thank Sinead, you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I'd like to go on record to thank the Department for your continued work and frontline staff's work, certainly while we've been offline. It's been very much appreciated and we're glad to be back uh, to be of assistance where and when we can. Um, in terms of your, your update, I, I just want to make a few notes. Against the pay dispute was very welcome um, and, I, and I do wonder if it was dealt with in a sustainable way when we look at, um, no doubt, there are other pay issues right across the health sector. Um, and you did rightly mention domiciliary care packages and, and the rate of pay that those staffs are receiving. And for that to be a sustainable career path, both in the private and uh, in the public sector. Uh, and I do wonder um, if we can find a more sustainable way of looking at paying going forward right across the sector. Um, I do have to note a bit of disappointment in terms of the stroke care conversation that was being had. Um, the consultations, as you pointed out, were very well attended. I had asked um, in my own constituency of South Down that there be a uh, an opportunity for the peoples in the Moorans area who geographically potentially could stand uh, to be the most impacted and unfortunately that did happen didn't happen um, and I, I think that there possibly could have been much um, a wider feed into that if if the rural areas had been accommodated more and I hope going forward that 
there is accommodation, uh, no doubt, to the submissions made on their behalf um, and the argument for having fair access. Um, I, I welcome uh, Jerry's comments, but, and I won't repeat over because I know time is an issue, Chair, in terms of the um, neurology recall and also Dun, Dun Murray uh, report. And, and you did answer the Chair in terms, of, and under, I accept what you're saying about um, there having to be PSNI checks. But I'd like to know uh, a timeline at this stage and when you expect that report will be made public and that it would be made um, public entirely, you know, without any restrictions to it. And also, um, can I read from your comments today that there is a commitment that the Minister will be bringing forward the legislation as recommended uh, by the Commissioner for Older People? And the one other issue um, I would like to raise, I, I really genuinely welcomed the, the announcement that the IVF treatments would move to three cycles. And I'm very conscious of particularly of uh, couples and women because there is an age uh, limit to when IVF is is available to and I'm conscious of and I understand the it isn't just about resource or money I understand that a system has to be put in place but it seems to me particularly cruel that there may be a female of a particular age group who will lose out because there's a short window of time while you're sorting this out she may cross that threshold of age and i would therefore ask have the department looked elsewhere to see is that available to that cohort of women um, in the short term that that they just simply weren't around to hear the announcement but but lost out um, so specifically like okay that. thank you um just picking up some of the comments uh, I mean, I, I take your point on, on stroke consultation, and I think it, you know at this stage it's something we'll, we, we hear you loud and clear, and we'll bear it in mind in future consultations. I think um, the, the particular difficulty there, there was a huge number of events across the province, notwithstanding your comment that you, you felt it, it, it wasn't entirely adequate. We felt it gave coverage. We got huge traction in that. We, I think we deferred the closing date on at least two, two occasions. occasions yeah. Um, to try and accommodate that, but certainly we'll take your points on board and, and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly bear them in mind going forward. Timelines on uh, the independent report, slightly out of our control. As I said, the, the safeguarding aspect we have with us for fact checking, mm -hmm. um, when we get through the facts and that, it will go back to the independent uh, CPEA. The time that they finalise and put us, it's, it's the nature of an independent report that we can't seek to control them too closely. So that will come in to us. At the, at you, we are on record as committing to publication of the report. It will be the t specific timing of that when we receive it will be an issue for the minister. I think, arguably, on, on past experience, um, publication of such a report is more helpful if the minister takes a brief period of time on receipt to consider it, so that he can put his commentary alongside, so that the report isn't published in a vacuum and people asking, well, how does the minister feel about that? Um, the other components of it, as I say, that, that's very much in the hands of CPA. They've indicated us they're working through that as quickly as possible. Uh, in terms of the legislation, again, I, the, the, the minister, as, as we know, has only been in place a couple of weeks. That's an issue that he'll be looking at in detail. We've done some preparatory work on that. He hasn't yet concluded specifically how he's going to move forward on that. I suspect it's something that he'll want to engage with the committee about in, in fairly short order. And I, I think your, your points in IVF. Again, that you know, this document, only, and, and I don't want to play the time card. We've had this a couple of weeks. We're frantically looking at this and trying to do some work. I think it's a very important and well-made point, and we'll certainly yeah. take that away in our future deliberations on this issue. Thank you. Um, Orlea, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard, sure. and uh, the team. Um, just a couple of quick points, and then two questions. Um, so, first of all, the the issue around. Um, the um, Protect Life 2 strategy, mental health in general. Um, I just want to say that I'm really pleased to see the department. Obviously, that strategy was published, Richard, in the absence of an assembly, which we were delighted about. Um, but I think just even the renewed commi commitment around mental health um, as a whole um, is, um, is to be welcomed. Um, 
the, also alongside the, you had mentioned around the development of a new substance misuse strategy, which again I think is timely. I know that there's a report coming out shortly from um, Kieran Donnelly in and around addiction services. Um, so I think that's important that that piece of work um, is, is um, going to be compiled soon. I don't know if you referenced um, the minimum unit pricing. I know it was, um, there was a, a draft consultation that was carried out around that piece of work, but possibly, and not to take my suggestions on board, but it might be timely then if we get that piece of work published alongside, because you have all the crossover with the substance misuse and with, um, with alcohol. Um, the, my question is then, the issue around the, which I think is really important, the scoping exercise that you're going to do around the waiting times. Um, I'm not sure if, if yes could factor in the GP waiting times for in-house counselling services. I got a letter from the board yesterday stating that they don't actually record um, what the waiting times are for those services, the counselling services in primary care. So I don't know if you could factor that in into that scoping exercise around um, the more general waiting times, because obviously, again, it's something that's been coming up um, you know, across all communities and the media. Um, so I think that would be that would be important if we could factor um, factor that in. Um, also, I know that there's two business cases that have been um, in with the department in and around the Hollywell um, facility, the, the mental health facility, and I know that the perinatal um, the perinatal business case um, is also in with the department. If I'm right, the Hollywell I think is at design stage. The perinatal um, wouldn't, wouldn't be at that at that stage, but it's just to see maybe for some reassurance that those projects are still priorities for the Department of Health. And again, you have all those cross linkages with mental health um, and suicide prevention. And then just finally, um, I, I can't go without not mentioning the, the MESH. And again, I want to thank the department because again, in the absence of an assembly, I think the department done brilliant work around that campaign. Um, we've made a lot of progress with the Belfast MESH clinic. Um, and I'm delighted with that, and I know a lot of the, the, the um, women, um, and indeed some of the men that are injured with mesh implants, appreciated that job of work, and including the 3D scanner. A lot, a lot of work was, was done, and thank you. But again, I just hope it's still an issue that's still a priority for the department, because there's a lot of issues um, that still need to be worked out. I know some of the car pathways have stalled, the ECR process. Um, has stalled, and, and there's some women that are that are caught up in the middle of all that. The nice recommendations are obviously looking to lift the ban. We still have issues in and around that, and the regulation of devices. So it's just really to keep it on a marker um, on the department's priorities. Hopefully, and I'll meet with the minister obviously in time just to take him through all that. Thank you. Thanks. For that. Um, just a couple of brief comments. I think the, your point on the GP waiting time for in-house counselling services. If you. Content will take that away and look, look into it. I, I don't know the detail of it at this stage, but I, I can understand the importance of the point. Um, the Hollywell facility and perinatal, it's, it's easy to sit here and say, yes, it's a priority. The rubber hits the road when we know how our priorities match up their future budget allocations, because the real thing is, is it a priority that sits above the cutoff point or below the cutoff point? Until we get a budget allocation for future years, we simply don't know that. But yes, they remain important mm -hmm. to us. Um, Mesh, thank, thank you for your kind comments and, and thank you for the work you and others have done. And there were some issues that you brought to our attention that we weren't aware of. We're very grateful for that. It allowed us to intervene. I think we are in a different place. Mm -hmm. We're not yet in the perfect place. Mm -hmm. More remains to be done. Work <coughs> yeah, yeah, work. Is there any detail? Um, no, other than to say that um, I think we are in a much better place than we were. I mean, I've, as we have done and Richard has done, we've met with those who have been injured as a result of Mesh. And, um, I think the service, you know, uh, you know, continues, uh, and there, yes, there is some more work to be done in terms of actually getting that onto a uh, on firmer footing. But again, yeah. there's a commitment to doing that. Okay. Minimum unit pricing, just uh, that was yeah. the other mission. Uh, Matter you uh, mentioned and, and suicide, protect life too. Um, I think. Thank you for your comments around protect life too. I think there's probably a, may well be a future committee meeting which you would particularly want to focus on that. We will require the the support of all government departments, this committee, and all of society to begin to make an impact uh, in, in seeing through the implementation, full implementation of Protect Life 2. And in, you know, pricing, as you know, it was a, it was a, a commitment under the last uh, executive and work that the then Justice Minister and Health Minister took forward before the collapse of the executive. Uh, that is a matter which we will ad address in the new substance misuse strategy. And again, it's something which the, uh, the Minister is actively considering. 
Thank you, um, Pam, and then we're going to Paula. So. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for being here today. And just say that said that we absolutely appreciate the work on the ground by the, the entire health service. We know it's incredible, um, and the biggest problem is just getting to that point where you're being dealt with. So we understand that, and we thank you and your, your senior team for for the good work you've done over very challenging years, recent days. Um, it's very difficult to limit your questions to two um, on such on all these subjects, but. Um, I will attempt to be very brief. Um, I just want to touch on um, autism as a, a first and, and ask you um, if uh, there is any plans for to have any um, external or independent scrutiny mechanism um, to evaluate the implementation of the of the Autism Act of 2011, and also. Um, if the department can provide evidence that the budget for autism services has kept a pace with the rising prevalence rates and incident figures, that would be the, the first one. And um, the second one would be around um, measures to um, to ease the pressure, I suppose, on the likes of um, uh, ED services and that. And I'm thinking of pharmacy. You know, what plans have you got going forward to? to you know, to engage, but we know the pharmacists are um, very good and very willing to do more, um, but they need a bit of resource to do that. And also, um, if, if there's anything more on um, uh, physiotherapy self-referral, um, that would be good as well. And just to top it off, is there are, are there any plans to look at how um, recording um, of information across the health service, across the trust, because we know there are different technologies in place, different systems in place, recordings different, um, and that often leads to <coughs> postcode lotteries, so if there's any plans to deal with that. Okay. Um, on, on the first point, if you look at the, the autism position, I think there's a lot of detail in that. It would be easier to come back with a more comprehensive written response, so sure. that, that's okay for you. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of ED, the pressures, I, I touched on the ongoing work in urgent and unscheduled care. I think we're seeing that as a potential game changer for us yeah. in this space. John Maxwell, one of our consultant colleagues from the Royal, has been leading in that. Um, we'll be getting drafts shortly. Yeah, yeah it's quite a wide ranging review. So, we're looking for example, I mean, one of the issues the member referred to there was regarding recording of, uh, of information. In terms of service provision, standardisation of service across the trusts in terms of what we deliver around urgent emergency care is a key issue for uh, for that particular review. So they're looking at that. They're looking at access services. They're looking at assessment and admission uh, units. Um, they're looking at uh, how we can uh, strengthen emergency ambulatory care. And um, a particular issue for us is the care of the elderly in terms we're seeing increased attendances of elderly people and the pressure that's then putting on the hospital system. So again, there are there better ways in which we can work around that as well. So I think when the committee gets an opportunity to see that later in the year, you'll see that's been a very, very thorough review and hopefully some really constructive um, proposals coming from that to try and yeah. deal with that issue over the next 10 to 15 years. I think in that context, Chair, just to add, it, it touches on a very important point, some of Jackie said. When we, we talked earlier about the Encompass project, um, quite often we talk about that as a big IT project that's going to make more information available. One of the fundamentally important things about Encompass is it's going to drive standardisation yeah. of pathways for the provision of care across the system. One of our strap lines that we're working on is what we call the one system approach. The idea that we have a proliferation of either different IT systems, different mm. care pathways, different approaches. You know, everyone in Northern Ireland needs to receive the same you know, access to the yeah. care on the same timely basis and the same qualitative basis, and that standardisation is a big, big issue for us. Um, you also talked about physiotherapy self-referral, the NDT approach. Some hugely positive stories coming out of that. I, I did at the day it was announced. I. Um, an unnamed local radio presenter. I remember used the phrase, but I'm a taxpayer, I'm entitled to see a GP. Um, when GPs were saying, there's no point in seeing me if you've got a musculoskeletal issue, you're far better going straight to a physiotherapist. So I think there, there's an issue for us in watching how this evolves. It's great, it's some really positive things. We, we have a big job of letting the public know about the availability of the service and that they can self-refer and make direct yeah, access. Yeah. 
Um, I think, and I say just the differing approaches have touched on that we, we standardisation is a huge issue for us. Yeah, that's great. And just very briefly on the back of that, um, just another thought is palliative care. And I know uh, the stats are very high of the amount of people who die in hospital. Mm -hmm. and that's not where you want to be dying. And I'm just wondering, is there are there any pieces of work going on to um, to, to avoid that circumstance? Because that, what's like, what you really don't want, yeah. especially with the pressures on um, AD services, that's not a place to be when you're in you know, the last yeah, no, of your no, life. It's absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean the, we, we published Living Matters, Dying Matters back in, mm -hmm. in two, 2010. We have a regional working group which was established in 2016 to begin to take a, a, a regional approach. Uh, we have, as Richard mentioned in his introductory comments, we have five uh, hospices uh, providing excellent uh, services in Northern Ireland. We currently have commissioned the Health and Social Care uh, Board to, to look at how those services are funded. Um, and, uh, you know, we have used uh, some money in the short term from transformation money to uh, ensure that Marie Curie, for instance, their rapid response uh, service is enhanced. We have uh, put some of that money into enhanced uh, training uh, for uh, GPs because, again, primary care needs to be supported and are trained and have the skill set to support people at home, uh, again augmented by the specialist uh, s support that the palliative care uh, teams uh, can provide. So, uh, you know, it is, it, is a, it is a tragedy that too often too many older people are transferred to uh, ED departments either from their own home uh, or from residential or nursing homes uh, when actually the most appropriate care is to ensure that those staff, family members, feel supported by the service that is there to wrap around them at, at, at a very important time and that people don't die uh, in somewhere they would rather not die. And that is a fundamental commitment and we need to make significant inroads in that. I think it, it, the, uh, alongside everything we do in terms of the, the complexities of uh, reconfiguring a system, it's engagement with the public. I worry that in the past, People have maybe heard us talk about this and think we want a hospital bed back quicker. Yeah. This is about giving people dignity yeah. at a very challenging time. And the other big issue is for all of us in society, we need to have the conversations with yeah. our loved ones. We need to think this, this is an, an yeah. inevitable happening for all of us and having those conversations so that there's a, there's a big yeah. engagement piece for us Absolutely. too. Uh, can I just interject at that moment? There's a charity, Life and Time, who have set up in Restrever, and I would ask people to maybe, if you have a moment, look at it. It, it really is a prime example that we should be considering um, in terms of dignity and dying mm. and making the opportunity at home. The work's tremendous. Thank we should look into that, certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Pam, thank you. And Paul. Thank you. Apologies, I was meeting with Jeremy Corbyn. Um, the, uh, so I missed the start of it. Um, two, two, two questions. Um, you, you, you said um, uh, that the community pharmacies play a significant role mm. and um, very much part of the transformation agenda going forward. So I'm wondering, therefore, how you are going to address the um, comment in the Northern Ireland Select Affairs Committee report that the budget allocated to community pharmacies is 20%, sorry, 20 million deficit. I also wonder how you're going to deal with the recommendation in the doctors and dentists review and remuneration, the 5.2 million, where you're going to find that from. You, you spoke very highly of, of our medics, how mm -hmm. are we going to properly fund them? So that's really a budgetary issue. Um, you also then went on to talk about transformation and the role of the AHPs in that. Spoke glowing terms there about physiotherapists, and yet the physiotherapy workforce review was meant to report last May 2019. Um, the deadline was missed. There's a meeting in July, and you haven't met since because of cancellations on your part in terms of taking that forward. The second part of that, therefore, is that in December 2016, in a Department of Health response, you said that there was going to be a regional medical lead and clinical leads in each of the trust areas made up of MDTs, um, of physiotherapists, OTs, etc., and they are not in place. You said you were going to listen and learn from patients and clients, and again, that hasn't been in place. So, budgets and our um, MDT workforce. Thank you. Okay, thanks. The, in terms of community pharmacy, um, there, there's ongoing dialogue with the community pharmacy. I, again, I would take the opportunity to place on record 
the amazing contribution that community pharmacy makes to the provision of care, I still believe there's huge untapped potential. Um, and certainly they believe that. Um, the issue for us uh, that we've been working very, very positively and constructively with them on is about trying to find some transformation funding available for community pharmacy to allow them to shift services. Again, as members of the public, I think we need to be prepared to interact in a better way. Um, I think too few of us think firstly about community pharmacy um, as a source of expert advice and guidance. Um, they're, they're so you're trying to find that 20 million, is that what you're saying? No, we're, we're trying to, we're continuing the discussion about finding transformation funding to fund transformation. Um, the 20 million issue, um, I don't want to say that we're looking to find the 20 million in the sense that we necessarily accept that that is the size of the gap. There are financial issues there. there. There's no doubt there's funding pressures. I met with Community Pharmacy last week again to talk about this. There's ongoing work. That's a dialogue that's continuing, but there's, it's a classic case of there's two sides to every story. Um, but we're working to find that, that meeting point in the middle on that point. But I absolutely acknowledge there are challenges in Community Pharmacy, and I believe there's, there's opportunities and significant contributions. 5.2 million doctors and dentists that we made a bid for that and monitoring. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. It remains yeah. a challenge that my magician here will <laughs> solve. We are um, obviously reviewing our financial position, as you would expect, routinely anyway. So after um, January monitoring, um, we're looking at our uh, forecast expenditure against the forecast funding. Um, and we're, um, I'm hoping, hoping that we will identify some slippage that will fill that 5.2 million gap um, and allow us to, to, to resolve issues. In so we're working to identify slippage between now and the end of March. And um, workforce around our... The, the, the workforce, um, I, the, the particular point you made, I, I'm not too sure of no. the detail of it. So we can well, well, get back to you on that. But as I say, one of the major commitments under um, Delivering Together was the uh, development of the workforce strategy, which again, we have published. Mm -hmm. There is significant and ongoing work looking at the entire workforce for the health and social mm -hmm. care, whether that's everything from uh, public health doctors, but also expanding that to ensure that it's non-medically qualified public health expertise and making sure that we're tapping into that, whether it's allied health professionals, whether it's dietitians, physiotherapists, mm -hmm. uh, OTs, uh, you know, the, uh, phys you know, electrophysiologists, mm -hmm. uh, radiographers, all of the way through. It's important. I mean, the transformation of health and social care, as as you've been delivering together, is fundamentally also about us as health professionals changing our roles. It's about a different cadre of health professionals with different skill sets. It's every one of us working to the top of our grade and working differently. Um, and that is a crucially important and a, a key element of the workforce strategy is our workforce strat our force feel valued, uh, the mm -hmm. appropriate support in terms of occupational health, recognising that it is a stressful uh, occupation working in the health service system, caring for people who are unwell, who are sick, is stressful. And we need to do more to look after our, our staff. So, again, on the specifics in terms of those particular reviews, happy to come, come back to the member on that if you're content. Sure. And just going to, sorry, I should have said this in my remarks. I just I, I applaud the work of the vaginal mesh, um, the, the service, but I would put on record that there's still the hernia mess issue there. There's a lot of people out there who are living in a lot of pain around that. So I just want to be clear that that was vaginal mesh, not hernia <coughs> mesh. And again, just to reassure the member, I have met with uh, those affected and I, I'm aware of those concerns. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I suppose it is it is important to mention that this has been really an initial high level sweep mm -hmm. across a broad range of the issues, and I get a sense, and I know the committee members will want to drill in in much more detail to a lot of those issues and other issues that may not have have arisen today. So I think that's that's important to note. Um, you said it at the beginning of your remarks, Richard, that we, uh, a statement we, or uh, a comment we need to attract new players into. And what I would, what I would say in, in response to that, what we need to do, we need to recruit, train, develop and retain our own staff here and uh, right across the north and right across the system. I think the core, the core issue is here is around transformation. And in order to achieve transformation, we need to co-produce the design and the delivery of services right across the board with patients, with their families and carers, with staff and unions, and with the, with the wider communities. So I think that's, that's where the priority is, because what we need to do is protect the, the world-leading service that we have here, protect the staff. We need to recruit core staff. We need to develop the services in a way that are sustainable. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the real priority. 
So I would like to thank the officials for coming. As I said, we will expect to be seeing much more of you. We have a lot of other issues we want to, we want to raise. But thank you for giving us that, that overview, and uh, we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, members, um, I'd now maybe suggest that we take a very quick uh, comfort break. Sure. So if we could go for be back, uh, five, five or ten minutes, I'm back here for 12.30. Okay, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. (laughs) 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. OK, members, um, we continue on now with uh, moving into dealing with the subordinate legislation. I refer members to the Clerk's memo on pages 83 to 86 of the pack. There are 17 statutory rules for consideration at today's meeting, and officials have been invited to brief the committee in respect of the Food Standards Agency and the HSC pensions regulations. Before we proceed with the food standard regulations, we need to dispose of, uh, formally of one mental capacity uh, statutory regulation, which is SR 2019-192, the Mental Capacity Deprivation of Liberty Revocation Regulations, NI 2019. I refer members to pages 89 to 95 of your pack. This statutory regulation was considered at last week's meeting when ministers were asked to note the SR Instead of formally agreeing the, when, uh, when members were asked to note the SR instead of formally agreeing the motion that the committee has no objection, can I ask the members therefore to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019/192, the Mental Capacity Deprivation of Liberty Revocation Regulations (NI 2019) and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. May I now invite officials from the Food Standards Agency to brief the committee on the Food Standards Regulations. And I'd like to welcome Mrs Sharon Gilmore, who is Head of Standards and Dietary Health, and Mrs Joy Cresswell, Senior Advisor, Operational Policy and Delivery. So thank you, members, and uh, please continue with your briefing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sharon Gilmore, and I would just like to brief briefly give you an introduction on the Food Standards Agency, and Joy will then provide a technical response to the specific statutory rules that are listed on the agenda. So the Food Standards Agency is a non-ministerial government department that works across Northern Ireland, England and Wales to protect public <coughs> health and consumers' wider interests in food. Our strategic aim is to make sure that food is safe and what it says it is. And in Scotland, these functions are carried out by Food Standards Scotland. Officials use their expertise and influence so people can trust 
that the food they buy is safe to eat and honest. Our strategy recognises that there are growing challenges around food safety, affordability and security, and it outlines our purpose and responsibilities and roles and responsibilities of others in meeting these challenges. Our supporting strategic plan sets out proposed approaches to ensure that consumers are consistently protected, informed and empowered. These approaches include using science, evidence and information both to tackle the challenges of today and to identify and contribute to addressing emerging risks for the future, and using legislative and non-legislative tools effectively to protect interests and deliver consumer benefits. The Food Standards Agency is governed by a board to act in the public interest and is accountable to the Northern Ireland Assembly through the Minister of Health. In Northern Ireland, the Food Standards Agency is responsible for devolved legislation and policy relating to food and feed safety, nutrition and dietary health, standards, food composition and labelling, including allergens. <coughs> Responsibilities of the FSA in Northern Ireland include advising ministers on food safety and standards issues, developing food policy and proposing legislation, providing timely and effective responses to food and feed incidents, setting standards and auditing district <coughs> councils, food enforcement activities, setting standards and auditing the delivery of official controls of meat hygiene, animal feed, eggs and milk hygiene and primary production, which are carried out by DERA on behalf of the FSA, and encouraging food producers and caterers to reduce levels of saturated fat, salt and calories in food products, and giving public advice on diet, nutrition and food safety issues. One of our key strategic priorities is food sensitivity, food allergens, um, and we are aware uh, certainly that we would, our strategic aim is to improve the quality of life for people living with food sensitivities and support them to make safe and informed choices to effectively manage risk. We know that the only treatment is to avoid these foods uh, and that there's a growing significant uh, health issue within the United Kingdom. We're currently working on implementing new allergen rules uh, to introduce full ingredient labelling of allergens and all pre-packed for direct sale food. Another one of our key priorities is the Food Hygiene Rating Scheme which rates food hygiene standards in food businesses where people eat or buy food. The 2016 Act means that by law a food business must display their rating sticker. And the FSA runs the scheme and district councils are responsible for inspecting and rating food premises in these areas. And another key area that we have, which I've mentioned, is the management of incidents, uh, where we believe that food is unsafe. Businesses must take steps to remove the food and feed from the market and inform authorities. So, a large focus of our work uh, in the last number of years has been preparing for EU exit uh, and maintaining the high standard of food safety and consumer protection that we currently enjoy within Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom. And then just briefly to say we have a close working relationship with the Department of Health in Northern Ireland on public health agenda, specifically in relation to diet and nutrition. For example, this includes the programme such as a Fitter Future for All Obesity Prevention Strategy, which is a cross-government framework for preventing overweight and obesity across the life course. And our key strategic priorities are reformulation of foods, which are high in sugar, fat, calories and salt, and reduction in portion size and sales of such food. And to do that, we work collaboratively across the UK and Republic of Ireland, sharing insights and aligning on policy development where it is most appropriate in Northern Ireland. Development and collection of robust Northern Ireland specific data on food consumption and food purchasing through the National Diet and Nutrition Survey and providing consumers with clear <coughs> nutrition information to allow them to make informed choices, including front of pack signpost labelling. We also have a close working relationship with DERA, where we have a service level agreement which outlines the arrangements for the delivery of official controls relating to meat, milk, egg, and primary production hygiene for the delivery of these official controls. And finally, we have a close working relationship with the 11 district councils in Northern Ireland, who are enforcement body for the majority of our food legislation. Thank you, Chair and members. Joy was now going to go through the more technical responses to the SRs that are listed. Okay. Thank you. Um, if it's okay, I'll provide a very brief summary in relation to the strategy rules that are before you today. Um, uh, as Sharon has said, we propose legislation through the Department of Health um, and covers the policy areas within the FSA's remit. Um, the statutory rules that are before the committee today demonstrate the general nature of statutory rules um, that you will come across from the Food Standards Agency. Um, they have been mainly to provide um, to date to, to fulfil the EU obligations to provide enforcement for food and feed law 
and to maintain the high degree of public health protection and informed consumer choice that we um, enjoy. Um, throughout the development of policy and legislation, the FSA engage with a wide range of stakeholders and our statutory rules are subject to open and public consultation. So, um, briefly, um, I've grouped the statutory rules into um, general policy areas. So, the Food Miscellaneous Amendment and Revocation Regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, um, number five, um, amends uh, the Fruit Juices and Fruit Nectar Regulations and the Food Hygiene Regulations 2006 to draw attention to EU legislation um, for food business operators and enforcers. <coughs> Um, it also um, makes um, some technical amendments and revocations to statutory rules um, in the food and feed law um, to uh, correct out-of-date references to EU and domestic legislation and revoke expired or redundant provisions. We have four statutory rules that relate to regulated products um, in relation to bottled waters, novel foods, condensed milk and dried milk regulations, and jam and similar products. The Natural Mineral Water, Spring Water and Bottled Drinking Water Amendment Regulations, um, Northern Ireland 2017, um, made amendments to the principal um, 2015 um, regulations on these products to provide for enforcement of an amendment to an EU directive on the quality of water. The Novel Foods Regulations Northern Ireland um, 2017 um, was, use, was, was required to provide um, powers to enforce a new EU regulation on novel foods following a review. Uh, novel foods are those foods that have not had a significant history of consumption in the European Union before May 1997 and under EU law they must be shown to be safe by means of a scientific assessment authorised um, before they are placed on the market. The condensed milk and dried milk regulations in Northern Ireland 2018 consolidated um, the 2003 principal regulations and a further amendment um, which implement EU directives on these types of products around compositional standards. And um, it also removed outdated references to food labelling regulations Northern Ireland 1996. These 1996 regulations had transposed the EU directive on general food labelling requirements. However, this directive has been um, repealed and replaced by a new food information to consumer regulations in the European Union. The jam and similar product regulations um, 2018 uh, provide for the continuing implementation of a directive relating to these products um, intended for human consumption and um, it revokes the 2003 jam and similar products regulations which referred to out-of-date labelling requirements from the food labelling regulations 1996. We have two statutory rules in relation to food contact materials. Um, the 2017 material and article in contact with food amendment regulations provided for the enforcement of amendments to a commission regulation on plastic materials and articles intended to come into contact with food. And they amended the 2012 material and articles in contact with food regulations. The um, EU regulation um, that relates to font to food contact materials is routinely amended to improve the clarity of rules, to keep up with technical innovations, and also um, improving technical and scientific knowledge enables experts within the European Food Safety Authority to evaluate and re-evaluate the risks um, arising from the migration of chemicals from food contact plastics into food. The um, 2018 material and articles in contact with food amending, 
Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland, um, also amended the 2012 Principal Regulations. Um, this related to the use of biphenyl A, BPA, in varnishes and coatings that um, are intended to come in contact with food. This chemical substance is used um, in uh, food contact materials, uh, such as hard clear plastic, or in resins that are used as a protective lining inside some metal uh, food and beverage cans. Um, this regulation, the EU regulation, um, was adopted to set limits um, on the amount of BPA that can be used in food contact materials. We have three statutory rules relating to um, food and feed safety. The Animal Feed Basic Safety Standards Regulations Northern Ireland 2018 transposed into um, Northern Ireland domestic law the revised EU Basic Safety Standards Directive that lays down um, basic safety standards um, in various areas around the protection from dangers arising from exposure to ionising radiation. Um, this uh, statutory rules applies this to animal feed. The Food Standards Agency has policy around animal feed because um, animal feed is consumed by food producing animals and it um, ensures that there's controls to ensure the safe production of food. The Food Safety Information and Compositional Requirement Amendment Regulations 2019 um, Continued, provided continued enforcement for a regulation on food for special medical purposes um, and for offences and penalties for breaching these um, EU rules. Food for special medical purposes are specialist foods intended for the exclusive or partial feeding of people whose nutritional requirements around vitamins and minerals cannot be met by normal food, foods. And the new regulation updated compositional and labelling rules for these foods, taking into account um, scientific developments. The new legislation around food information to consumers. It also prohibits nutrition and health claims around these foods um, to avoid the inappropriate promotion of these specialist um, products, which are for use under medical supervision and also extends um, rules um, on pesticides that apply to infant formula and baby foods to these type of foods for special medical purposes intended for infants and young children. The Food Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019 um, amended um, the public health labelling provision in the Food Hygiene Regulations Northern Ireland 2006 to inform vulnerable consumers of the potential risks with the consumption of raw drinking milk. Um, in Northern Ireland, there has been a public health um, labelling requirement on raw drinking milk, um, which stated that the milk um, had not been heat treated and therefore may contain um, organisms that were harmful to health. The Food Standards Agency um, believe that it is um, important to maintain good public health protection by extending the public health warning um, to vulnerable groups. And the additional statement to the uh, required labelling now states that the Food Standards Agency strongly advises that it, i.e. raw drinking milk, should not be consumed by children, pregnant women, older people, and those who are unwell or have chronic illnesses. The final three statutory rules um, relate to official controls. These um, three statutory rules were the Official Feed and Food Miscellaneous Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, the Meat Official Control Charges Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2018, and the Fishery Products Official Control Charges Amendment Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, Regulations Northern Ireland 2019. These three statutory rules um, give effect to a new official control regulation 27625 into Northern Ireland domestic legislation. 
This new EU regulation was um, entered or entered into force in April 2017, but has applied gradually over several years and was fully um, applicable from the 14th of December of 2019. It establishes a single legislative framework for the organisation of official controls across the agri-food chain. Official controls include activities such as audit and inspection of food businesses, anti- and post-mortem inspections in meat establishments, and the sampling of food and feed. These activities are carried out by competent authorities, and in Northern Ireland they are carried out by district councils and the Department of Agriculture on our behalf. These regulations were required so that existing um, enforcement powers um, and legislative powers to um, enforce food and food, sorry, food and feed safety laws continued to be able to be used by these competent authorities. Thank you for your time, and that's the end of my summary. And thank you indeed for that very detailed. I think that actually. Uh, illuminated a number a number of issues for us, so, so thank you for that. Um, the impact assessment on the official controls regulation highlighted a number of issues that were raised by stakeholders, including the time and the costs involved in familiarisation, which I think the, the sector thought were being under, underestimated. There were also some concerns around the port health officer's role and environmental practitioners. But I note the, that they were addressed to some degree in the impact assessment, but it is unclear to what degree. So I am just wondering, how, how the stakeholders feel now in relation to it? Are there still concerns outstanding? Um, with the, the stakeholders, um, we have an ongoing engagement with district councils and, and port health authorities on, on an ongoing technical basis. So, in relation to the, the familiarisation costs, we took on board in the final impact assessment and increased the familiarisation cost for enforcement um, officers. The official control regulations um, have some changes, but a lot of things stay the same. Um, but we recognise that, um, obviously, stakeholders actually needed time to read through that and come to the same understanding on that. The other... Um, in a, issue that they raised was around training and we in the Food Standards Agency in Northern Ireland have an annual training program that we work with district councils on the identified training needs that's on an annual basis and we will um, uh, work with them to identify any needs and if there's needs in relation to the official control regulations we will put that into the program that we run with them. We also will be working um, to provide official control guidance on these regulations. They will also be subject to consultation and stakeholder engagement, and we hope to do that in the future. Um, I believe the Food Law Code of Practice, um, which is the uh, Code of Practice and the Practice <coughs> Guidance for District Councils, will be out for consultation, hopefully in February time, and we'll be able to engage further with um, local authorities and district councils on that. Thank you. Um, in, and some of the earlier ones, 218, 219, 220, refer to a cost to business of £40. Can you outline what a business is in that context? Is, is it a food producer? Is it down to farmer level? Is the £40, £40 per regulation, per annum? So can you give us some more, some more context around those, those charges? Th those charges would be relating to the... Um, for a business, um, usually for maybe a, um, in, a, in a food manufacturer, for their um, quality control person to actually read the regulations and to consider them. Um, food businesses that um, would come under the official control regulations could include it's throughout the agri-food chain, so that could be anyone from a primary producer, a farmer, right through to a food manufacturer. And is it likely to include? every farmer or is it more a farm business that is also a food manufacturer? Um, it does include um, all, all food businesses and we would consider um, primary producers farmers to be food businesses um, but we would not inspect, expect to be a big impact on those type of businesses for them. They will find that the enforcement requirements which are actually under the hygiene regulations, this is around official controls 
which are undertaken by enforcement authorities, we would expect that to be have a less impact. Okay. And finally, from me, um, before I go to members for questions, is um, can you give any indication at this stage how these regulations uh, food standards, or, and food standards more generally are affected by the EU Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020? And I note, sorry, uh, Joy, just yeah. I note within your within your document you've uh, outlined that similar regulations these are being brought in in England, Scotland, and Wales. But bear in mind that we live on an island and that there's an imperative here to have frictionless cross-border trade. What uh, what regulations are being considered in the 26 counties and in the time ahead with with with, uh, with Brexit and withdrawal will that be impacted? These um, particular regulations are directly applicable now uh, in all um, four nations and also in, in the Republic of Ireland. So um, these will continue to apply for us um, going forward um, uh, through the implementation period. And um, in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol, we would still consider that we would be applying these rules. Okay. And do you have concerns moving forward that, that food regulation of food standards across across uh, all the regions will continue to run in harmony or that there could be divergence of standards there? Um, well, we, we are working in the Food Standards Agency with um, Food Standards Scotland and with um, Food Standards Agency in, in England and Wales to um, endeavour to ensure that we uh, comply with the, the, these as, as they stand. Yeah. Yeah. The four countries have very much been working together in the last two to three years, building up uh, what we call common frameworks, which are looking across the breadth of the legislation, the food and feed safety legislation, um, to look for parallel wells and ways and working together to ensure that sort of food standards and food safety is maintained, whatever the scenario is going forward. Yeah, but my, my concern is we have a very, very strongly developed cross-border, all-island food production economy. So what guarantees are there that those will remain in harmony, that there won't be divergence of standards, creating business and economic difficulties down the line? Uh, on the island of Ireland? The island, yes. Well, certainly we will, again, we are waiting sort of steer from the centre um, as regards to the Northern Ireland Protocol and how, what effect that will have on Northern Ireland and the statute book. But um, we are working with other government departments across the legislation at the moment, and it would be our uh, aim that our legislation here will continue to maintain those high standards um, that will be maintained throughout uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland. Okay. Thank you. So I have Jerry has indicated there. Thanks, Sean. Sure. Thanks, Sean. Enjoy for that. Um, uh, three quick questions. Um, in SR 2019-2018, um, there's a comment um, about trying to get the point for you. Number 29 under the um, Subsidy rules of uh, Northern Ireland. Um, it's page five in that, and page one hundred two in, in our pack. Uh, it mentions border control posts. Um, just a comment on that. If you could detail when these would arise, my under, my guess would be this would be in the midst of a, a health crisis, like a BSE type situation. But just a comment. Uh, if you expand upon that, please. Um, uh, in the impact assessment, on the same point. Page, uh, sorry, point 78 on the impact assessment. Um, there's basically an increased scope for goods, um, which will be subject to harmonised import conditions, I think is my understanding. I think it, it mentions that. Um, can you just detail how things would differ uh, as they currently are um, and what the changes would mean just in, in practical terms? Uh, and just finally, um, yeah, I mean, I, the chair mentioned about the fam familiarisation costs. Uh, I think some groups. Uh, stated they would be under if they thought they were underestimated. Um, is, is there a concern that I think in most um, responses in terms of the consultations there was a low level? In some cases there was zero responses, and I think the highest may have been thirty or forty respondents. Uh, and and it, is there a concern that things may have been missed just because obviously you know, things can be missed obviously? Um, and, and is there a concern for the with not the high level? Of consultation responses, but it probably will affect a lot of uh, businesses and organisations. Is there a concern that there may have been things that have been missed um, with, with these implemented? So, just those points, please. Yes, um, I'll, I'll take each question if you. You don't, yeah. if you don't mind. In relation to the border control posts, that um, this official control regulation is um, a 
bringing together um, a sort of a single framework for a lot of official controls um, that were held in different EU regulations um, um, historically. So, for example, when you talk about the border control posts, they were already um, uh, in EU law under a different name for different types of products. So, for example, the border inspection inspection posts or BIPs as we would call them were um, for uh, products of animal origin going in through to the EU for release in free circulation and those checks and, and controls were done. Um, you also had high risk feed and food um, and they were um, had to go through these were high risk feeds and foods that were identified from specific um, countries and they were food not of animal origin and they also had to were subject to checks in a designated port of entry before entrance into the European Union. Um, these have been amalgamated into a border control post. So these posts already exist um, and will continue. Um, so it, it's quite a bit of harmonisation and consolidation around those those um, checks. Um, uh, sorry, what was your second, yeah, um, again? second sorry. point? No problem. Um, around the import conditions, uh, point seventy eight of the impact assessment basically I may I may follow on from that. Mm -hmm. It might about increased scope of goods, um there be a harmonisation of import conditions. So just if you could give a sense of as best as you can yeah. how things would change as, as how they currently Yeah, I I I'd see that, that that is part of that consolidation and, and harmonisation. Um obviously the um European legislation has had a list of, for example, high-risk feed and food, which does change um, given what emerging risks there are um, from different countries. And um, th there is always that scope for that to increase. Um, then you mentioned your third question. Yeah, just on consultation, just um, which the chair obviously made a point about familiarisation costs and there was mm -hmm. concern about that. Just is there a, is there a concern that, you know, Generally speaking, there's been a low level of, of response in the consultations. They're concerned that you know, people may have missed that this was happening um, and there could be a rise in issues that wasn't foreseen by the FSA that could, could come out of this. Yeah. Um, we, um, the, we actually received quite a few responses on, from a Northern Ireland perspective. Mm. We, we had 17 and that's actually quite high for us given that it was a shortened consultation. And the fact that um, we were implementing this um, uh, in December, uh, the, in relation to the, the familiarisation cost, the, that main response came from enforcement authorities, which obviously the official controls are what they do, and they um, felt that they, they needed that extra time um, to, to familiarise themselves with that. So going forward, we will be engaging with them in relation to um, the guidance that comes out of um, the official controls, like the Food Law Code of Practice and Practice Guidance. And we will um, uh, uh, address anything in relation to training as well. Um, and, and just finally, Chair, if there are issues coming out of being so made aware of uh, sort of the, the implementation of, of them now, I mean, the FSA is one that speak to the organisations to kind of run through them or to we, we, um, yeah, we do have an on, yeah we do have an ongoing um, uh, schedule of, of engagement with uh, stakeholders so not only the district councils but also with industry on a regular basis um, we have regular stakeholder industry group um, groups that we would meet with and we generally discuss things like this and how they Im implicate um, we will also um, have, it is likely, a, another statutory rule which will come across um, to, uh, um, to enact the further delegated regulations that may come under this very large um, EU regulation. So there will be further consultation and further engagement. Thanks. Thank you. Are members content with that? Okay. Okay, thank you very much for coming along and for that very expert uh, breakdown of the issues and, and, and your very direct answer to the question. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we will then move on to uh, going through the official feed and food controls miscellaneous amendments regulations NA 2019. 
I refer members to pages 96 to 154 of the pack. This SR provides for the execution of powers and enforcement of the official control regulations, uh, EU regulation number 2017 forward slash 625, on official controls and other activities performed to ensure the application of food and feed law, rules on animal health and welfare, plant health and plant protection products. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019 forward slash 218, the Official Feed and Food Controls Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations NA 2019, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Number 10, uh, SR 2019 forward slash 219, the Meat Official Controls Charges Amendment Regulations NA 2019. I refer you to pages 155 to 198 of the pack. This statutory regulation provides for the execution of powers and enforcement of the official control regulations, regulation EU number 2017 forward slash 625, on official controls and other activities performed to ensure the application of food and feed law, rules on animal health and welfare, plant health and plant protection products. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that rule? Mm. If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019 -219, the Meat Official Cont Controls Charges Amendment Regulations NA 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? We agree. SR 2019 -220, the Fishery Products Official Controls Charges Amendment Regulations NA 2019. I refer members to pages 199 to pages 242 of the pack. This statutory regulation provides for the execution of powers and enforcement of the Official Control Regulations, Regulation EU number 2017 forward slash 625, on official controls and other activities performed to ensure the application of food and feed law rules on animal health and welfare, plant health and plant protection products. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019 forward slash 220, Fishery Products Official Controls Charges Amendment Regulations NA 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Right. SR 2017 forward slash 201, the Natural Mineral Water, Spring Water and Bottled Drinking Water Amendment Regulations, NA 2017. I refer members to pages 243 to page 254 of your pack. These regulations amend the Natural Mineral Water, Spring Water and Bottled Drinking Water Regulations. Uh, NI 2015 and implement Commission Directive EU 2015 forward slash 1787 on the quality of water intended for human consumption. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? Can I, if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2017 forward slash 201. The Natural Mineral Water, Spring Water and Bottled Drinking Water Amendment Regulations, NA 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Great. SR 2017 forward slash 157. <coughs> the materials and articles in contact with Food Amendment Regulations, NA 2017. I refer you to pages 255 to 265 of the pack. These regulations de amend the material and articles in contact with food regulations NA 2012 to provide for the continued enforcement of Commission regulation EU number 10 or slash 2011 on plastic materials and articles intended to come into contact with food. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? That being the case, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2017 forward slash 157, 
the materials and articles in contact with food amendment regulations NA 2017 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule are we agreed Great. Great. Thank you. SOR 2017 forward slash 233, the novel foods regulations NA 2017, and I refer you to pages 266 to 277. These regulations revoke and replace previous SORs to provide for the execution and enforcement of regulation EU 2015 forward slash 2283 regarding novel foods. The new regulations provide revised legislative requirements for placing foods on the market that do not have a history of consumption in the EU. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? <coughs> if not, can I therefore ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2017 forward slash 233, the novel foods regulations NA 2017 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule are we agreed right. sr 2018 forward slash 16 the animal feed basic safety standards regulations na 2018 i refer members to pages 278 to 286 of the pack <clears throat> These regulations transpose Article 21 of Council Directive 2013 forward slash 59 forward slash Euratom on revised EU basic safety standards, laying down standards for protection against the dangers of exposure to ionising radiation as it applies to animal feed. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with the, st the statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2018 forward slash 16, the Animal Feed Basic Safety Standards Regulations NA 2018, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. SR 2018 forward slash 77, the Condensed Milk and Dried Milk Regulations NA 2018. And I refer members to pages 287 to 299. These regulations remove outdated references to food labelling regulations, introduce improvement notices providing for non compliance, and consolidate two earlier SRs, streamlining the regulations into one statutory rule. Have members any issues they wish to relate, raise in relation in connection with the statutory rule? If not, can I therefore ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2018 forward slash 77, the Condensed Milk and Dried Milk Regulations NA 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. SR 2018 forward slash 78, the Jam and Similar Products Regulations NA 2018. I refer members to pages 300 to 320 of the pack. These regulations revoke and replace the 2003 regulations, correct out-of-date references to food labelling regulations and introduce notice provisions for non-compliance. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? If, if that being so, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2018 forward slash 78 the Jam and Similar Products Regulations NA 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. SR 2018 forward slash 186, the materials and articles in contact with food amendment regulations NA 2018, pages 321 to 330 of the pack. This SR provides for the enforcement of EU Commission Regulation EU 2018 forward slash 213 on the use of bisphenol A BPA in varnishes and coatings intended to come into contact with food <coughs> and makes amendments regarding use of BPA in plastic food contact materials. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2018 forward slash 186 the materials and articles in contact with food amendment regulations NA 2018 
and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? agreed. SR 2019 forward slash 5. The Food Miscellaneous Amendments and Revocations Regulations NI 2019 on page 331 to 366 of the pack. These regulations make amendments to a number of regulations relating to food and feed. These include regulations regarding raw materials and additives permitted in fruit juices and similar products, and measures to benchmark and mitigate against the amount of acrylamide in foods. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? Can I just make a point? It's rather than it's not specific to this, but I'm noting on many of these statutory rules the consultation um, refers to one or no responses, and I just think it might be worth the committee noting. Um, it may be that they're non-contentious issues and they're not going to warrant a response, or it may be that we've, there's a systemic failure in who is being reached, yeah. um, and that may come to light if, after this period, we get communications. So it may be worth noting at this stage. That clear? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019 5 Food Miscellaneous Amendments and Revocations Regulations, NI 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. SR 2019 forward slash 9, the Food Safety Information and Compositional Requirements Amendment Regulations, NI 2019, pages 367 to 375. So, this <laughs> statutory regulation provides for the enforcement of EU delegated regulations regarding specific information and compositional requirements for food for special and medicinal purposes. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? Uh, therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019 forward slash 9, the Food Safety Information and Compositional Requirements Amendment. Regulations NI 2019, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? agreed. 2019 uh, uh, forward slash 110, the Food Hygiene Amendment Regulations NI 2019, and refer members to pages 376 to 395 of the pack. This SR statutory regulation amends labelling provisions for raw drinking milk to inform vulnerable consumers of the potential risks associated with its consumption. The labelling proposals will harmonise labelling requirements across NA, England and Wales. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019 forward slash 110, the Food Hygiene Amendment Regulations NA 2019, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? agreed. Okay, members. I would now like to invite Mr. Andrew Dawson. Hi, Andrew. Andrew is director of workforce policy at the Department of Health to brief the committee on the next item, which is SR 2019 forward slash 62 concerning health and social care pensions. And at this point, just you're very welcome, Andrew, Thank and you. give you a second to draw a breath. But at this point, I would just like to declare my own interest in terms of being on a career a, a career break with uh, one of the trusts here, and also that my wife works as a nurse and uh, in in the in the health service. And in addition to that, that I myself am a member of NIPSA. So I just want if there's any other interest, maybe the members wish to declare. No. Okay. So. Uh, Andrew, you're very welcome here, and uh, if you could just go ahead with your presentation, please. Sure. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, this uh, is in relation to the Health and Personal Social Services uh, Superannuation and the Health and Social Care Pension Scheme Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2019. I'll just refer to them as the 2019 regulations from here on in. Um, they were made on the 26th of March, 2019. And they came into operation on the 1st of April 2019. Uh, the, purpose, the main purpose was twofold, really. One was to amend the employer contribution rate uh, for the schemes, and two, to renew the, the, renew the member contribution rates that had been in place previously. The background, I suppose, to these was that uh, the pension scheme actuary, uh, in this case the government actuaries department, 
uh, is under a statutory duty to carry out an actuarial va um, valuation of the scheme. This valuation is essentially an assessment of the cost of pension benefits building within the scheme. The resulting valuation report sets out the rate of contributions to be paid by employers and the employer cost cap. Just to explain further, the cost cap process is a tool for managing the overall value of benefit provision in public service pension schemes. The, cost cap, the employer cost cap is the target cost of the scheme and was determined at the 1st of April 2015 and set out in legislation. The cost cap also acts to limit the overall cost of the scheme to taxpayers. If the cost cap is breached by more than 2%, it triggers a change either to members' benefits or requires increased contributions uh, to reduce costs. The outcome of the valuation uh, was uh, therefore cover, cover, carried out by, by the Government Actuaries Department was that the employer contribution rate uh, to be paid for the period 1st April 19 to 31st March 23 needed to increase by 6.2% pension will pay. That uh, essentially meant from 16.3% to 22.5%, with, at that point, an estimated uh, cost of £120 million per year for the Department of Health's arm's length bodies, of which there are 17. Um, the, the reason, I suppose, for the breach of the cost cap uh, and the need for the increase in the employer contribution cost was, I understand, driven principally by a reduction in the rate of uh, what's known as the superannuation contributions adjusted for past experience rate, or SCAPE for short. That rate essentially is the notional investment return on contributions in the scheme. In terms of the member contribution rates, these were set under the previous regulations for a four-year period, and that expired on the 31st of March 2019. The 2019 regulations therefore renewed these rates uh, indefinitely. In the absence of such legislative provision, the HSC pension scheme would have been uh, legally unable to collect contributions from members from the 1st of April 2019. The Department held a targeted consultation on the draft amending regulations between the 14th of February and the 14th of March 2019. The truncated uh, consultation period was simply due to the tight timescales we were working to in order to progress the regulations in time for the 1st of April. 34 responses were received to the consultation. In the main, uh, scheme members who responded raised two technical issues in respect of member contribution rates and tiers. And whilst these were very valid concerns, the Department was limited in terms of the practical steps that could be taken at that time. Even though the Scheme Advisory Board had been commissioned to provide advice on the possible improvements to member contributions and benefits. Other consultees focused on the potential impacts of increased employer costs, and I will deal with each of those uh, specific areas in turn. Firstly, then, in relation to the, the technical aspects of the pension contribution uh, rates and tiers, the history to this is that the Department had asked the HSC, HSC Scheme Advisory Board in 2018 to provide advice on the appropriateness of the existing member contribution structure. This included the implications uh, of a shortfall in the yield of the scheme, uh, and just to confirm the yield is the percentage of pension will pay that the member contributions must provide to the scheme, and whether to consider moving from setting contribution rates for part-time staff based on whole-time equivalent pay to using their actual pay. The Scheme Advisory Board, uh, as a result of uh, being asked to conduct that work, concluded that it would be fairer to have an increase in the number of contribution tiers tier boundaries should be automatically uplifted for pay inflation, and it would be advisable to maintain the current position of using whole time equivalents rather than actual earnings, as making this change would reduce yield and therefore require increases to contribution rates. Following receipt of these findings from the Scheme Advisory Board, it was concluded at that time uh, that uh, as, as, as the agenda for change pay bans, which essentially f fed into setting the rates for, for uh, contributions to the pensions, the, as those agenda for change pay bans had not been updated at that time, it would not have been impossible to ascertain whether the required yield from the pension scheme would have been achieved. Um, just in terms of other moving parts then, there were uh, two other events that intervened to create further uncertainty. Uh, the valuation findings that I've described just at the start of the presentation, and also uh, an English uh, Court of Appeal judgment. Uh, 
The uncertainty in respect of member contribution rates and tiers was exacerbated by the judgment in uh, the McLeod and Sargent cases, uh, jointly known as the McLeod judgment, uh, in, and that uh, English Court of Appeal decision was in December of 2018. In summary, the Court of Appeal there decided that transitional protection provided to firefighters and judicial pension schemes in GB, uh, that those provisions amounted to unlawful age discrimination. Uh, this was anticipated, and uh, as it turns out correctly, anticipated to have impacts uh, for all public sector pension schemes right across the UK. At that stage, the UK government was seeking leave to appeal to the Supreme Court, uh, with a resulting assessment that at that stage it was going to be impossible to assess with certainty the, val the, the uh, value of those pension arrangements. Consequently, then, uh, the then Chief Secretary to the Treasury provided a written ministerial statement to the House of Commons on 30th of January of 2019, pausing the cost cap mechanism element of scheme valuations pending the outcome of the McLeod litigation. In practical terms, uh, this meant that UK government policy was that the employer contribution rate to be implemented from the 1st of April of 19 was as if the cost cap process mentioned earlier had not been paused. Hence the increase uh, in the need, need to uh, sorry, hence the need to increase the employer contribution rate from 16.3 per cent to 22.5 per cent. Just for the sake of completeness uh, today, the Supreme Court uh, in June of last year actually refused the UK Government's uh, application for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court uh, in respect of the McLeod judgment. Uh, so therefore, we are now in the position today where the determination of remedies is ongoing across the UK for all public sector pension schemes. Uh, just to address the counterfactual, uh, what would have occurred if these regulations had not been put into operation? Employer contributions would have been collected at the wrong rate, leading to a deficit in employer contributions. Further, uh, as mentioned earlier, there would have been no legal authority to collect member contributions from the 1st of April of 19, uh, as these were set out in regulations that expired on the 31st of March of that year. Similar action was taken in England, Wales and Scotland to increase in, uh, employer contributions to address the cost cap breaches and in light of the uncertainty following on from the McLeod litigation. Turning to the financial implications, the increase in the employer contribution rates created a pressure for the Department of Health, its arm's length bodies, including the Fire and Rescue Service, but that's under a different scheme, uh, and Family Health Services and directional bodies of uh, £144 million. The Department has received the full budget allocation in relation to this increase and has processed onward allocations to all concerned. The departmental uh, expenditure limit uh, pension pressure experienced in 2019-20 was funded from some additional monies from the Treasury, with the remainder, as I understand it, found from within the Northern Ireland bloc. The new employer contribution rate for the scheme applies for an implementation period, which is 1st of April 19 uh, to the 31st of March 2023, uh, in other words, commensurate with the, the, uh, with the, the regulations, uh, and the Department has received recurrent funding in relation to this increase. With regard to the employer contribution rate for the following, independent general medical practitioners and their staff, independent general dental practitioners, mutual GP out of hours providers and for palliative care service providers, including hospices, which are deemed to be directional bodies in respect of the HSC scheme. The department decided that these providers would continue at the 16.3 rate temporarily whilst work was ongoing to secure further funding to meet the additional cost. The contribution rate, when increased, was back then backdated to the 1st of April 2019. I understand that funding has now been allocated to cover those increased uh, employer superannuation costs too. Finally, then to conclude, you'll probably be relieved to hear, in uh, terms of the mechanics of the 2019 regulations themselves, the Department did unfortunately breach the 21-day uh, rule, for which uh, I apologise. We did advise uh, the examiner that this was likely uh, in an email at the beginning of February, as I recall. The delay in finalising the draft regulations for, uh, for the examiner was largely due to delays outside the Department's control in finalising the new contribution rates, which were then going to be material to the setting of the rates in the, in the regulations. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Claude Andrew. Um, we're advised that part-time workers are required to contribute a percentage of the salary uh, based on the full-time equivalent yep. figure. So, can you confirm that that means that someone who's earning 24000 on a part-time basis 
is paying a different is is earning while earning the same amount as someone who's earning twenty four thousand on a full time basis would be paying different contributions. And does that therefore mean that the part time worker would receive a higher pension? And if they don't, could that potentially discriminate against people who are more typically working on part time uh, work patterns, such as women? Sure. In relation to the detail of the first point, uh, if it would be possible to write back to you just in relation to just explaining the detail of that. But in respect of the second point, which is, I suppose, more material just to the policy position for which I would be responsible. Uh, yes, I mean, that was something that uh, we would have asked the Scheme Advisory Board to consider, uh, given the fact that if, if, you are, if you have different rules in place for part-time versus full-time, then essentially you could be in an indirect discrimination uh, position. Um, so I suppose that, would, that was something that would have been referred to the Scheme Advisory Board at the time. Uh, I, it would be something I would really personally want to consider um, in, in slower time now that we've got these regulations through and that we, we can con consider, I think, in less of a hurry for, for the next round, uh, those particular policy issues in relation to the, pot the potential for um, for the, the issues you, you mentioned. But yes, um, certainly, it, it, I suppose it was considered by the Scheme Advisory Board at the time, um, and I think we were able to proceed uh, with some assurance that there was no discrimination at this stage, but it would be something I would much prefer to consider in slower time. Uh, and have the Scheme Advisory Board reported at this point? The Scheme Advisory Board did report um, to our initial commissioning, um, which was done in 2018. So at the time, the Scheme Advisory Board had uh, said it was advisable to maintain the current position of using the, the, the whole time equivalents rather than actual earnings. Uh, on the grounds that this would uh, reduce yield, but certainly that's uh, something that we will want to consider going forward in terms of, whilst yield is obviously very important, so is not discriminating against anybody. Yeah, and I suppose it'll be it'll be interesting to see the uh, examiners' uh, uh, report in relation to that. In relation to that, which is it is it is a complex area and, and something that we're we're building in now for a period of time. Sure. We we'll listen. I have a few indications at this stage. At, at this minute, I have Jerry, Sinead, and Gemma. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Andrew, for that. Thanks. And just following your point, Chair, um, I mean, maybe the, the committee should consider maybe we hold off in supporting ASR until we get that um, sort of report back or the, the details of maybe um, further human rights um, reports or investigations. Because I'd be concerned that if we're asked to endorse something which, as you said, Chair, could have um, untold or sort of direct consequences um, for, for women in particular, I would, I would be concerned about that. So. Maybe we can talk whether we, we hold off on, on supporting that or not. Um, so just in response to the um, responses, Andrew, sure. uh, if you could, as best as your understanding of it, um, 34 responses um, were uh, submitted. Um, <laughs> if you answer this, I would be grateful. Um, do you know if there are 34 individual responses? Or, I mean, my understanding is sometimes uh, in consultations with the department and, and other departments, uh, sometimes unions submit uh, responses, and that is uh, treated as one response, whereas they can represent you know, 20, 30, 40,000 um, people. So I would just be concerned that <clears throat> excuse me, the 34 responses are actually maybe wider and uh, reflect that a wider concern that uh, exists about this issue. So if you could answer that. that sure. Would be... um, we received, as you say, a total of 34 responses uh, uh, from 22. Uh, that included 22 individual scheme members, uh, a GP practice, an out-of-hours provider, Marie Curie Cancer Care, um, the British Dental Association, the British Medical Association, the Royal College of Nursing Hospital, uh, sorry, Hospice UK, the Foyle Hospice, the Northern Ireland Hospice, the Society of Radiographers, uh, and two of our trusts, the Southern and the South Eastern. Uh, we could, uh, if you haven't already seen it, we can provide a copy of the consultation response document, which summarises that, and also the Please department's see. response to the policy issues. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, following on further from your point, Chair, and I note that um, in those responses, they did talk rightly about that whole time mm -hmm. um, measure and also the potential cliff edge. So you could have somebody who has moved into a different tier in terms of uh, their contribution. Yeah. But if they are a part-time worker, you know, it, it, the cliff edge is all the more exaggerated. I like the chair rightly pointed out a lot of these roles are predominantly filled, as I understand, by females. Um, and that's why I was a little bit alarmed that there, it, it was deemed that there was no need for a quality impact. 
um, and I think that would be most helpful on top of the report being brought back um, and hopefully that will be reaffirmed through anything so I think there would be some question marks in that area. I don't know if you have any reasoning or logic or was it something that applied in other places um, you know, in England and Wales and I know you said whether it was a, a matter of copy and paste and that's why it's there or was there some rationale that I've not considered as to why whole time was considered? Uh, again, I suppose we were acting on the advice of the Scheme Advisory Board at that stage. But, however, I suppose there is a further point for us as the policy owners in the department to, to assure ourselves as well. Um, and essentially, I suppose this at that stage was uh, these 2019 regulations were not so much a change <coughs> in policy. They were essentially, if I can use the phrase, a keeping the lights on measure. Um, whilst essentially just replicating what was going on before, except in respect of the increased employer contributions, and that was essentially just to be able to fill the, the projected financial deficit if that wasn't if those weren't in place. So we didn't consider there's a policy change, and I suppose that was what fed into our findings in the screening. But I'll certainly be happy to write back just to go into further detail on that. Okay, thank you. Emma? I'm just looking for clarification. In their response, the RCN stated that. A failure to fully fund additional employer contributions could place HSC trusts on additional financial pressures and raise concerns about the impact the increase will have on GP practices, charter hospices and are seeking assurance that funding will be made available to these organisations as soon as possible. Yep. I'm just checking, did you say that this money's already been found? Yes. And for how long? Recurrent. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I wanted to know. And um well, obviously, any decision, any decision by this committee will be subject to the examiner's report. Um, but is it is it true to say that these regulations, that this has been in place since uh, April? Is that? Yeah. Uh, yes, they they came into operation on the first of April, twenty nineteen. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Um, there's there's a suggesting that we defer to next week. What, what do members feel in relation to that issue? Have we time, Chair, to defer to? I mean, it's already gone ahead, as I understand, but in terms of getting the detail right, um, what options do we have available, even if it's represented next week? You know? I suppose the advice is that members do have the right to seek a motion to annul if they're not happy to with the rule, but bearing in mind what we've been told, this has established and allowed for the continuation of pensions to be paid from yeah. last April. So getting rid of the regulation that allows those pensions to be collected and paid into is something members want to consider. Uh, but in, in relation, in relation yeah. to the time issue, there would be one further week when we could, yes. if members wanted to seek clarity yeah. on, those, on those issues. What would the impact be of, of annulment? Uh, the annulment then would, um, without anything to replace it immediately, uh, would again remove the legal, uh, the legal entitlement for us to collect members' contributions, uh, and also uh, would put the, uh, I suppose, the viability of the pension scheme in immediate jeopardy. Yeah, so, Chair, would it be valid to consider that? I think that would be the nuclear option in terms of going down the road annulment, but certainly listening to um, the examiner's report and looking at future-proofing this in terms of are there options going ahead to amend or because it, it won't be presented to this committee, as I understand then, for the next block period that has been covered. Is there a, an opportunity to make an amendment somewhere? I mean, a suggestion could be if, if the department was just to, uh, again, freshly instruct the Scheme Advisory Board to prepare a detailed report on the part-time and, and whole-time equivalent okay. issue, which we could then come back to present to the committee at a, a future date, uh, which could inform then the future. Chair, just, just, just to add, um, as well as the examiner will be coming in next week, is my understanding, um, I believe our role is sort of the technicalities mm -hmm. of the law. I mean, can we get a brief advice from a human rights commission or sort of relevant organisation to that um, sort of regards just to keep ourselves um, right on top of uh, the examiner's report? Is that, is that possible? Take advice from yes. Clark. Yeah, we can we can seek advice from any other source that you would. So would it be would it would it be correct in saying there's a, a maybe where we take another look at this next week, but we very carefully consider all the implications of of mm. of the mm. uh, of the regulation and and uh, but we defer it to next week for a final uh, decision by the committee. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are there any other other questions for Andrew before we let him go? Mm.
Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your Thank you. presentation you. and your responses. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move in quickly now into the uh, the 22 SR 2019 forward slash 62 Health and Person Social Services Superannuation and Health and Social Care Pension Scheme. Yeah, we don't need to put that officially. We can. We, we okay. We have decided to defer that one to next week. That's it. So we move then to SR 2017 forward slash 200. The Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme Amendment Regulations NA 2017 on pages 405 to 413. These SRs amend principal regulations to add universal credit to the Healthy Start Scheme's qualifying criteria. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? Sorry, Chair, can I just clarify? Is that just um, an amendment to bring it up to date? You know, using the terminology universal credit, or is this replacing something that's already existing because it refers to an, an eight-week voucher? We're not reducing anything here? or you know. um, I think we'd need to seek an answer. We, maybe Andrew would have been able to answer that. But oh, right. Sorry. No. Yeah. We can seek advice on that. Okay, it's just I don't want it to. If it was, you know, if it's just about introducing universal credit into the system, um, fair enough. But if it's an amendment to the actual entitlement, I would be cautious. Yeah, we can seek advice on that. Yes, just quickly, Chair. Um, can we get sort of clarification on um, how the universal credit? Um, the applicant is on universal universal credit. How that is presented. Um, I'm going around about this the wrong way, I suppose. But um, sometimes, or in most cases, universal credit is obviously it's a long process. There's delays, so I would be concerned. <coughs> excuse me, if somebody was applying for universal credit, but it hasn't been confirmed in terms of their first payment, or there's been a delay, or there's an appeal. So, just on, on what basis is the, um, the the applicant's universal credit claim sort of taken into consideration? If that if that makes sense. So I propose then that we also defer that one to allow advice to be taken Thanks. On, those, on those issues. Yep. Are we moving there to yes? Uh, SR 2019-117, the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme Amendment Regulations, NA 2019, uh, contained in pages 414 to 425. These statutory regulations amend principal regulations to add state pension credit claimants to the Healthy Start Scheme's qualifying criteria. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? If not, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019-117, the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme, Amendment Regulations NA 2019, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. SL1, the Food Safety Information and Compositional Requirements Amendment Regulations NA 2020. Can I refer members to pages 426 to 435 of the pack? The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to provide for the enforcement of specific requirements for food for special medical purposes for infants and infant formula and follow-on formula. The rule is subject to negative resolution. So I suppose this is our first example of where actually the, the more normal process would be, where the department sets out an SL1 to us, indicating what they're thinking of doing, and then asking for our view on that. So are members content that the department makes the statutory rule, which will then return to us for consideration? Yep. Great. Thank you, members. That ends that section of our meeting, and we'll move then into correspondence. And can I refer members to pages 436 to 466 of the meeting pack and to the table papers? There are 13 items of correspondence in the pack and two in the table papers. So I'd like to just draw your attention to a number of items. Items 26.1 and 26.9 are requests to meet the committee from the British Association of Social Workers and the Mental Health Policy Group. Are members content to consider these under the forward work planning as part of the wider workforce strategy, mental health and the other issues raised? I intend to do brief introductory meetings as chair in the meantime with those, with those groups. Okay. Happy with that. Thank you, members. Items 26.3, 26.4 and 26.12 are from individuals regarding the work into the neurologist Michael, of neurologist Michael Watts. 
Are members content to note these for now, pending a reply, which I referred to earlier, from the Department of Health to our request for an overview of the ongoing and planned inquiries into this matter? We will come back to the matter uh, in a moment under forward work planning. But are members content that we, uh, we note them for now, pending that reply from the Department? Chair, could I just add that um, those correspondents, they may be reassured to know that we just put it in record, we will assign time for this app committee um, to discuss it in detail you know, once we've get, get gathered that information. Yeah we, yeah, we can take that into account. And we will be doing a planning day as well, so we can, we can take those matters into account. Item 26.5 is a letter from the College of Podiatry. Are members content to consider, as part of primary care, aspects of, the, of transformation scrutiny at a later stage? To consider that. Yeah. Item 26.6 is correspondence from an individual calling for better support for sufferers of endometriosis and for improved menstrual well-being education through the school curriculum. So, are members agreed to forward that correspondence to the Committee for Education? and that we consider the health aspects under our own forward work planning in terms of waiting lists and training. Great. Members content? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chair, yes, just a note, I, I'm sponsoring an event by Intermediosis UK. I can't remember the date, but it's, it's in the next few weeks. And it's really about raising awareness and how we can better support them. But I do think this is something, just for your own information, I will be raising it at our away day, because I think it actually would need more scrutiny mm -hmm. than what you've just proposed. But we can get back to that. Yeah. Yeah. And a skilful plug, Paul. Well, thank you very thank much. You very much. <laughs> Item 26.7 is correspondence from the Chief Social Worker at the Department of Health to the Chair regarding the meeting to discuss the Power to People report. As we have scheduled a, depart a departmental briefing on reform of adult social care and the Power to People report for the 5th of March 2020, I don't intend to pursue a separate meeting at this point in time on that issue. Um, so are members content that we await the, the briefing? Item 26.8 is a memo from the Chair of the Education Committee regarding the Department of Education's Emotional Health and Wellbeing Strategy and suggesting that the Committee for Education and the Committee for Health consider the matter at a joint committee session. Are members content that we add this to the Forward Work Programme and ask the Clerk to liaise with the Committee for Education to schedule a joint briefing session when the Executive's Mental Health Action Plan is published? Are we content with that approach? Yes. Yep. Item 26.10 is correspondence from an individual regarding mesh implants. Are members content to invite Mesh Ireland to present to the committee and to invite relevant officials to respond on that issue? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chair, th that, I think that's just one organisation. There's a number that are um, like Harley Mesh and I, and yeah. you know, I think that there's like the Mesh. I think that there's there's an issue there if we invite one to address the committee and not all of them. Well, I suppose the issue is that only correspondence has only been received from one, but I suppose yeah. anybody who knows the organisations could uh, inform them that, that that's on our agenda, and if they, if they send in, we could compile it and, and coordinate them all. Does that sound fair? Yeah, yeah, fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Item uh, 26.2 is an invitation to members to attend the Business in the Community Healthy Working Lives Conference on Friday 20th of March. Um, so that's an open invitation to all members to go along if you're able to. I think it will be good to see some of the committee at that if anyone's free on that day. It's in correspondence there. Item 26.11 is a copy of the urgent written statement from the Minister of Health on the Department's response to the, to the coronavirus. A further urgent written statement was received last night and is in the table papers and hard copy, so members can have a look at that. Item 26.13 is a briefing note from an academic in Queen's University of Belfast on the UK withdrawal agreement, statutory instruments and devolved competences. Are members content, content to note those items? I refer you now to the table papers. Item 26.14 is an email from the BDA, the British Dental Association, regarding doctor and dentist remunerations. Are members content to consider as part of our scrutiny of workforce and related matters at our forthcoming session on that? Thank you. Item 26.15 in table papers is correspondence from the Minister for Health requesting an opportunity for officials to brief the committee on the Department's progress in implementing the recommendations of the O'Hara report on hyponatremia related deaths. Are members content that we add that to the forward work programme in the next few weeks? Yes. Yep. 
I would advise members that further to the suggestion at last week's meeting, the correspondence tracker has now been amended to provide for a follow-up column in respect of whistleblowing correspondence forwarded to relevant bodies. Thank you. Uh, forward work programme now we are moving into. So can I refer members to the forward work programme at pages 468 to 469 there? It's a table, uh, two tables. Are members content to note the forward work programme? And are you content? Well, are you content to note the forward work programme as it is there for now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And are members content to note also that the clerk will write seeking written briefings ahead of the sessions lifted, listed within that work programme? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And members, further to correspondence considered last week on the neurology inquiry. I have taken advice, and I believe that we could invite the neurology inquiry to brief us, though any briefing would be confined to process matters and could not get into a discussion of evidence taken to date or findings until the inquiry concludes. Um, Can I invite views of members on whether we would like to proceed to invite oral briefings, or should we await the, the response of the department on the various inquiries underway as planned? So... I would like to suggest we we'll, we'll, we'll meet them as soon as possible, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, could I second no, that? that? That's based, that's based on that, that he will he will go over the the uh, processes rather than give us a report on on the inquiry. Sure, because I mean, there's questions. I'm sure um, I have certainly quite a few, but the, the processes and others might raise questions as well. So I think it would be useful, Chair. Yeah. yeah, Chair, I just think it, it, it just needs um, a, a bit of an injection of urgency around this now. It has been going on too long for those people who have no answers of any type or no even visual um, that, that it's being taken seriously. And I think this committee is a perfect place um, to have those discussions and start opening the, the conversations in a more public way. And, I th- uh, Chair, uh, and without hope not jumping ahead too much, I think um, the same could be said um, for the Dunmurray. Um, their home, that this committee may be a place to put a bit of urgency behind that and invite in the Commissioner of Older People, Eddie Lynch. Okay, we can take that as a suggestion, yeah. Uh, can Follow. you just clarify who it is we're going to be inviting? Is it the Department of Health? Is it the Independent um, Neurology Panel? Is it the RQIA, what they're doing? You know, there, there's about three or four work streams. I have no problem with them all coming at the one time, but I just want clarity because, for example, the independent inquiry panel, we meet separately. Are we now bringing that to form part of this? You know, I, just, I think there's just so much to it that we would need a bit of time to make sure. But I do agree there is a sense of urgency. So. And, I, and I agree with that also. I suppose the consideration is we have asked the department to provide a briefing on, on, those, all of it. on those. And the question for us today is, do we wait for their response to that and then decide who to invite, or do we start to invite people? Just, just a quick point for members to notice that that is expected back within the time scales of 10 working days is what you know is, to be, is the agreed time scale with the department. So we would hope to have that letter back to you fairly soon. Okay. Would it be back in time for the next meeting, potentially, or do we know? Yeah, it should be in time to table at the very latest. Okay, Paul. I think given that, it would be sensible to uh, hold fire until we receive that. Okay, so it, rather than have it kind of for all slapdash, I think. I th- I think it may our our next step may be better informed if we if we wait yeah. to see what the department come back with. We may be able to target our next step more. But I, I don't without taking away from the urgency. I think yeah. we're we're looking at coming back to it next week. Sure. Do do you have any sense what the department, the department is going to say in the letter, or could it be anything really? We don't really know. Yeah, uh, we don't, I suppose. We wait that. <laughs> but uh, could, we, could we agree, are, are we broadly agreed that we, we, we get the department's response and consider our next meeting next week? And then? It's about 10 days, sorry, so it's due, it would be 10 days when they respond. But it's, in prior, it's in prior to this meeting, so it's already in the system. Yeah, yeah. So we would, we would expect and hope that it will be with us for next week. Okay. So are we content with that approach? Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay, thank you. Um, any other business? Do members have any other business? Sorry, I forgot because um, I wasn't here. John Stewart registered his apologies because I don't think he's been. We haven't first... received. So we haven't. He hasn't yeah. been replaced yet. So. Okay, so that remains to set the date, time, and place of the next meeting. Uh, the d- next meeting will take place at 10:30 a.m. on Thursday, 6th of February, 2020, here in the Senate Chamber, Parliament Building. Senate Chamber, program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.